Welcome to the Great Bays Tennis Podcast. I'm Steve Smith, along with co-host Yvonne Osaretz. Hello. Let me call up an oldie goldie. Someone's helped us a great deal with these podcasts. 192. If you listen to our podcast, he does not need an introduction. Ring him once, twice. Hello. Davey Anderson. I just told our listeners, yes, sir. You, you don't need an intro. You've been part of the podcast. Appreciate you helping out with our uh, efforts to improve tennis teaching. Hey, Dave. Hey, how are you doing, Yvonne? Good, good, good. Glad with, to be here tonight. Talk some tennis. Yeah, let's exchange some notes here. A little housekeeping in the beginning. Um, yeah. We had this uh, young man from England, Lawrence Hyde. Yeah. Took great notes. We put those notes on, uh, I think, Facebook. Mm -hmm other social media outlets and then uh chad Burriel and yourself uh tell us a little bit about your manual so people are really happy i, I get some phone calls and some emails um the manual that uh it's it's taken on i don't know three or four different shapes and forms uh i like the original best it was uh in a binder three ring binder and uh really divided up into, um, you know, several sections, technical, tactical, mental, emotional, and then, uh, physical. And then it had a, a personal growth section at the end. And then, um, I really got to give a lot of credit to Bob Neff, who, uh, really was instrumental in helping to put that together. Um, specifically since I can't type and, uh, he, uh, he did a great job with it and, and, and helped steerhead it. And then since then, we've had a uh, couple of revisions. Um, it's just a tool, I think, for kids to uh, a resource for them to have a, a little bit of a working knowledge of the information they're trying to take in on the court and, um, you know, to spend a little quiet time where they can sit with a manual, take some notes on, on what they did that day and uh, kind of be their own coach in that sense. And, I think it's a great tool for the parents as well. I've found over recent years, maybe past decade and a half, that more parents read it than kids. Um, but we went online with it uh, and, and, and just kind of send it to people online now. And um, we still have hard copies as well, but just found it to be easier online. Yeah, but with Bob Neff, I can remember meeting him many times at your place. Uh a Bob Neff story. I know he went on and, and got a PhD in sports psychology, does some work with the USTA. But I remember yeah, having he, a, a Russian player and a German player. And mm -hmm. he, Mark and Marvin. Yeah, and he interviewed both players. And Mark said that she, he said, what, what's your image? What's, what's the, the most beautiful sight for you in tennis in your own mind? And Marvin had a one-hander hitting her one-handed backhand, running, passing shot down the line. And then uh, Mark said, holding the trophy in the stadium with thousands of people standing and applauding. And then afterwards, with all the juniors you had, which is a large number in the coaches, we met and Bob, uh, he, he shared the story. And he said, one of these guys has a problem because you know it was much, it was much better to have the, the image being having a great skill versus holding the trophy. We, we struggle with so many people being outcome um, outcome oriented, but no, I appreciate, yeah. appreciate donating that. Uh, people just have to go back a few days on Great Base Tennis Facebook. Uh, Chad Berry, who's won a couple of national titles, he's been a guest. He was with us for five years. He has a manual as well. Actually, Miron Man, uh, he he just sent me a note. He goes, "This is awesome." Um, he did an internship when Chad was with us. For our listeners, Miran, I've known him since he was 10, 11 years old. And he said, well, I, I said, he goes, I have to have one of these. I said, well, just use that and just, but just give credit where credit's due. And, and uh, he goes, yeah, yeah, I'll just add a little authenticity to it. You know, I have to, and then I said, well, just the history of the people that have trained at Richmond Hill up in Toronto, that would be, um, mm -hmm. I like the, the thought of the people who've gone before us with, um, uh, but no, thanks for that donation. I mean, it's uh, yeah. it's, it's free. And um, Yvonne, why do you say something? Why would you do like a one-minute commercial on our fundraising efforts for donations? 
Fundraising, yes, sir. Yeah, um, in regards to the manuals, they're also up on the website. If you go to the resource tab on the website, they're at the bottom there, both Chad's and Dave's. So, um, again, thank you, Dave, for providing that. Um, fundraising, oh, of course. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, fundraising efforts um, have dwindled, I'd say. Um, you know, we had that big, big push in December for the tax, the tax, um, the tax part of it where people and the, end, write of the off end of the year yeah. at the end of the year and we've been lacking so you know our mistake first we uh, haven't been really on top of it but um the people that have been supporting and have donated monthly um we still receive the funds from them so that's great we're really appreciative of that we're trying to we're using them in, in various places for example we bought a computer over there um helps us get videos done faster um, podcast done faster and better. So um, we we're striving to to do a better, um, better job, and eventually, hopefully, maybe hire hire some help to really really push this effort forward. Um, you know, really put more emphasis on content outline and just sharing and spreading the information because um, that's what we're really all about. We really want to get the the right information out to to as many people out as many eyes and ears as possible. Well, I think with that, um, I've been told many times that uh, we're rich in content, but we're not too slick. Yeah. So we just we just need to get more help. Um, before we get into tennis, uh, sp yeah. spring, do uh, you have a chance to watch any of the NCAA basketball, the men or women? I followed uh, just mainly on highlights on ESPN. Um, I, I actually found myself watching. I was, I was kind of suffering from a little time poverty here the last few months and so i i usually do um caught a little bit of the frozen four um and uh but i watched a lot of the post game interviews with uh the men and women um a few of those and find that i find that to be interesting when i don't have the time to to catch all the games and such women's basketball you and i spent a lot of time on the same college campus Tyler, Texas, mm -hmm. for a decade, I would walk through Wagstaff gym to go pick up my mail. And I know little or nothing about basketball, but I could just tell how much women's basketball improved throughout the eighties when I first started. And then when I left, um, I know last time we were on, we didn't, we couldn't pronounce, we couldn't come up with, uh, Gino's last name, university of Connecticut, but he was in the semis came right down the last second, yeah. the level of play. And is it Don Staley or Don Staley? I should, that's so bad. That I, I think I'm going to go with Don Staley, the so South Carolina coach. Uh, the interviews are fantastic. Tennis coaches should just yeah. listen to these coaches. So she said, if the players don't respect their parents and the parents don't respect each other, we have no chance. Z mm -hmm. Zero chance. And, you know, just, I think so many times tennis kids, uh, of course they're not on a team, but, um, could be more respectful of their parents, more respectful of the opportunity. The, uh, the college hockey was, was phenomenal men and women, but just yesterday, the world's, uh, championships were played Utica, New York, unbelievable hockey. The women, some people say it's the greatest rivalry in sport, the Canadians versus the U S and growing up, uh, yeah. on the Canadian border, I just, I love Canada, but I don't love Canada when the U S is playing men hockey. And it was they played three on three, not four on four. They should have played five on five. That, that'd be like um, the 10 point tiebreaker instead of a third set in tennis. Just mm -hmm. So disappointed when they did that. Another thing I hear have uh, we just worked down towards tennis is uh, Team USA, Navarro and Pagula. They're representing Team USA. Mm -hmm. You know, it's public knowledge. Both their parents are uh, billionaires. Yeah. So. It's just, you know, that affluenza, you know, you can't have rich parents and hungry kids. I think that's phenomenal. I was doing a clinic. I, I spent some time with Robbie Mudge, great guy. Uh, he played doubles with uh, one of your students, Ian Dempster. Yeah, play, I remember him spent at the club. They did, they did a really good job there. Uh, mm -hmm. Dempster was a freshman and then Tony at uh, Wake Forest. Brusky. There's another yep. name I probably have wrong. Uh, Ian was on the, uh, played 
he brought him out of uh, retirement. He was a graduate senior or a graduate student, and uh, they won the NCAs because he just simply yeah, wait. It pretty hard to find somebody who could serve and go to the net, serve and volley. Yeah, I just watched Baylor and UT online uh, a little bit, and there wasn't a lot of it. <laughs> some great athletes, some good tennis. Um, Watching the men? But the, yeah. With uh, yeah. with Robbie, he, you know, he did some hitting with uh, Navarro, and um, he was offered a job to be the sparring partner. Didn't take it. He said he only spoke to the father one time. He said, Ben, hmm. Ben Navarro said, young man, or he asked him, young man, do you have a growth mindset? And he said, that's all he, that's all he was told. But I've heard, cool, I've heard her hmm. be interviewed and uh, I've seen articles now where they put her ahead of Tyriac as who's the richest person in tennis. And, mm -hmm. um, I will love how she handles herself. And she does say that, uh, you know, their father and mother, you know, they didn't start out with money. They, they made money. They earned it. What's that expression? The good old fashioned way. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about money. We're going to talk about the USTA. Let's get rolling on that. One thing about the USTA is people make a lot of money. Now, generally people who make a lot of money who end up doing something in the business <laughs> world that helps other people make a lot of money. But when somebody just gets a big fat salary, like the, the CEO of the NCAs, I read he was making 1.7, 1.7 and that's where, you know, years ago where, well, you know, the, the basketball coach has got a, a shoe deal worth $400,000 and he's got a kid on the team who can't go to the, his uncle's funeral. So yeah. when we start talking about the USTA, the most talked about uh, topic in tennis, USTA player development. I don't think that people talk too much about USTA grassroots levels, but more at the, at the top um, with, uh, I know we've got some handouts here on the desk or not handouts. That's my being a t teacher from years ago. Javier Palinque, or mispronouncing that last name. Got it in front of me. He, uh, he writes something every day. He's um, not supporting the efforts in the organization, the structure, the methodology, A to Z with the USTA. But I think he should be heard. I actually... Um, remember recommending him. Uh, I knew some of the people that were on the board for the Florida Tennis Association. I said, "No, you should definitely hire this guy as your CEO." Florida Tennis. It didn't happen, but at least he got a phone call. But yeah, we've got something on Patrick McEnroe. We got the Wayne Bryan letter. We got the Jose Garris letter. Got something way back when that I wrote. Um, those interested in American tennis and had a lot to do with one of your classmates, uh, Craig Tiley. Mm -hmm who at one time was mm -hmm. offered the job with uh, player development, be the director with, but I think first things first that, you know, maybe I got this line from you through your father. Don't throw stones. If you live in a gas and a glass house. Is that from your old man? He said it a lot and yeah. I threw him a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Don't throw stones. I continue, I, no matter how much he said it, I continue to throw him. Yeah. Don't throw stones. If you live in a glass house. With, but I think thir first things first, or first thing first, singular is, uh, I think people have to just ask themselves, what are they doing for the betterment of tennis? You know, instead of looking at someone else, what, what does everyone do as an individual to try to improve the welfare, the, the growth of the game? But with Andy Roddick, his podcast, besides our, our letters here that were dug out and read and reread, Cracked Rackets, one on Patrick Macron, others. Um, with here's something that I like about Roddick's uh, podcast thus far. I mean, obviously he's a, the Joe Rogan of tennis podcasts already. It's on TV, um, but he's a straight shooter. I mean, he just wants to know, for example, how much money is spent on executives and how much money is spent on players. Mm -hmm. With, with um, I just wanted to start with this when it comes down to money. Um, Dave and I were at a tennis academy. It was called Seguzo Bassett. Robbie Seguzo, really easy going guy, but it was, I mean, they were married. So it was Carlene Bassett Seguzo, but he wanted it to be Seguzo Bassett. At one point it was going to be Ball Terry's and I told him they should run their own show. 
and you were part you and I were part of that show. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. Chris Everett owns the place now. And you know, the late Bobby Curtis, he was my go to guy. He used to run tournaments that I played in. That's how long I knew Bobby. He was Mr. Florida Tennis, great guy, straight shooter as well. In fact, he was big buddies with the, with not only Andy Roddick, but the Roddick family. They um, donated money and, um, and, and it had Bobby Curtis's name on it. It was very flattering to Bobby. And it was just to help help kids kids in, in need from Florida Tennis. But um, just think how this works. The USDA built a matching building. So you go to the beautiful Boca, there's two large buildings. Well, when you and I were there, there was just, they're building one, but now there's two. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The USTA paid for that. You know, public, it's really public dollars. And they built it, so mm-hmm. it's a private business. And then after the USDA paid for building it, they paid rent. They paid rent. And mm. I was told, um, you know, Andy Brandy worked there as uh, the director of tennis, and then he worked with the USTA. So that was another good resource for me. It's the late Andy Brandy that they're paying $110,000 a month. Now, you know, that gave them access to 29 tennis courts. You know, maybe it was $110,000 a year, but it just, that sounds like too little. And $110,000 sounds like too much. But, um, yeah, the player development, they were at Crandon Park. I spent time there. Um, they were in Boca. They were in, they still are in Carson and mainly in, in Lake Nona. Mm-hmm. Do you think that you could do that for me? Could you build a house in Dallas and then I come live in the house and you pay me to live in the house? Could you do that for me? Talk to your wife. Does that make, does that make well, sense? I, I, I do remember you living there for a few months. <laughs> I, I don't know if I paid you. I think I might have made you a Jimmy Dean biscuit one morning. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's. Uh, um, I mean, they got quite a deal. Like they, they allowed it to all, cover all the overhead and come in and do your thing. And and uh, you know, I with the podcast, and I don't want to get off track on you. I'll let you, you kind of guide it, but, um, I mean, everything needs a GPS a little bit. And, and I think, you know, whether, whether it was Roddick's podcast or the, the letters that you, you're going to reference here later, just seems to me there's no GPS on all this. Um, let alone even, yeah, not a GPS, but also not even knowing the, where, where we want to go. Um, but I think you made a very valid point, Steve, in that, um, you know, it, it is easy to point fingers. And I, I, I think that, you know, even if the USCA exists or doesn't exist, I think that we as, you know, people on the ground coaching, I mean, we, we got to take a little bit of responsibility in it. And uh, we have to really look at the welfare of the game right now really hard. And uh, I know we're going to go into that, but uh Yeah. Well, a day late and a dollar short. I mean, you know, maybe people have already forgot the letter, but uh, in Jose's letter, I'm pretty sure he said three years, but I believe it's every two. Um, obviously, with letters, I mean, you can proofread letters backwards and forwards. One of the best ways to proofread is read a letter backwards, word for word, read it. And then actually, when you proofread, if you make, if there's one mistake, you have to go back and, depending on the size of the uh, the piece of work, they go back and start all over again. But so there's going to be mistakes, but I believe it's every two years that, um, Katrina Adams, she was the president of the USDA for f- four years. That's because Andy Andrews, um, his daughter fell victim to cancer. Then unfortunately she passed away. He stepped down. He, so he never served the term. Mm-hmm. He was all set to be president. And I, I had met with him. A friend of mine set that up and I met with him and he, he told me, it's all UST related. He told me that if I went out to Memphis, he would support financially support what I was what I was going to try to help people in Memphis with. But that mm-hmm. never that never happened because uh, you know that's just circumstance. Um, with um, I do think the announcement of the one of the USTA, the 
governing body of tennis want to have 35 million people playing by the year 2035 and thinking, okay, we need to spend more money on that than um, they are in player development, making the budget cuts. And that was really what Jose Aguirre's letter was about, is not keeping the, the torch lit. They certainly are. It's not like they stopped it. But really, if, if, if they were to, if they're netting $500 million a year, and I heard Matt Clore say this, who's worked for the USTA as a national coach, if they were to, you know, for spending 25 million, it's really not that much out of 500. But I do think that that's, people really aren't talking about um, how much money goes to grassroots development versus player development. They're just talking about, and I think that's, that's what happens uh, throughout all of tennis's, uh, you know, the, the beginner is forgotten, you know, the, the trench work, what really needs to be done. And I do think that's one of the problems that a lot of administrators, they don't have a connection um, with what goes on the court because they haven't been on the court. I mean, certainly even the best, best, the best known coaches in tennis, um, you know, they're just really coaching the best players. And it's very, very seldom is it someone who's been with one of those players since they were a beginner. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's so many levels to, to this. Um, I, I think that, I mean, there's just absolutely no doubt we have to get rackets in people's hands and, and get people excited about the sport. And, and, uh, um, you know, Wayne Bryan in in his letter to the USDA, which, you know, you could read once a week and really never get tired of it. Um, but he, uh, you know, we got to get kids exposed to the sport and, you know, the USDA's initiatives. I mean, we, we certainly, have a good feel for that with Mike Carter and the background and the training that he had, like I had from you. And, um, but the, you know, the, the, the clinician going into the schools and, and doing it in front of three, 400 kids in a gym and all of that. I, I don't know what, what that did to ignite tennis numbers in America. My gut feel from just being around the world and seeing courts and that is that it hasn't really had much of an impact. Um, I think nobody sells it better than a tennis coach. Um, that is, you know, I mean, you, you, you can recruit people at the grocery store to play the sport neighbors. And, uh, um, I think that on the, gr- on the ground right now, we, we need to really have a incredibly aggressive united effort, um, to, get more racket, get rackets in kids' hands, number one, get a unified approach to how we're going to retain them, which um, if they, if they don't learn the skills, you know, properly through uh, people that really have uh, a competent level of of teaching and understanding, then the retention is not going to be there anyways. Well, it'll just be a catch and release. And, uh, you know, we need to, we need to be really, conscientious of it, I think, as a group of people that care about the game. So when Jose Garris' letter came out, I had Wayne Bryan's uh, letter pulled up, and his letter is 5,352 words. We'll, we'll put it on, on Facebook. Actually, listening to Patrick McEnroe, we'll go through the history of some of the people in charge of player development. Everybody in tennis knows Patrick McEnroe, John's brother and I mean, he got to be 28 in the world. I mean, a lot of people throw stones at him for getting so many wild cards, but you still have to win matches. So, But he even says that, you know, the name McEnroe, he certainly had many privileges and many doors open. Um, but more on Patrick later, but with Wayne, uh, he is like the Pied Piper. I know you've had a chance to to meet him. I, I had a chance to watch him uh, walk, watch him work more than one time, but I was at Davis Cup. I was doing some uh, work for the Roddick Tennis Academy, was given great tickets, and I went with my son, Connor, and we just tagged along with, with Wayne was, uh, it was the ball kids, but it was also kids from the community, and uh, he just, so we just, I was just part of it, and he spoke to those kids, it was just watching practice, and he said, you're all going to look straight ahead. You raise your hand if you have to go to the bathroom. (laughs) You're not looking left. You're not looking right. You're not talking. 
if you're t- if you look left, look right, you're talking. And he's a guy who gets, you know can bring a lot of fun with the music, his personality. You know, this American public is. I mean, Wayne Bryan and his wife they should be in the Hall of Fame for for parenting. But um, so anyway, I mean, these kids just you know he goes no, they're you're just going to watch practice, and you couldn't hear it, or you you could hear a pin drop. Say it the wrong way. You couldn't hear. You could hear a pin drop, but. Yeah, you know, he he basically gets around to this, and he uh, he says that the player development program should be dropped. Um, it really, in the end, is like what, what's been produced since 1987, and that that's and all the money that's been spent. Um, let me go through a little bit of the history. Um, there wasn't a player development department till uh, 1987, and uh, they hired Ron Woods. There's two Ron Wood, Ron Woods, uh, Pen- Pennsylvania and Texas, and mm-hmm. you know Ron Woods from Texas. He did so much with the USPTA. Mm-hmm. Um, also, in years gone by, it's not like I spent all that much time with with Ron Woods, but he was uh, 20 years with the USTA, 10 years player director of player development, college professor, um, PhD, PhD in physical education. I remember having a conversation one time because I think the USPA chief figured out and said, well, okay, to get more people to come to the conventions, we're going to call people up and ask them to introduce the speaker. Um, they're going to call somebody up and say, would you um, not only introduce the speaker, but then another person would be asked to hand out the award. So it's a pretty clever way to get more people. And more people should go to educational mm-hmm. events. But he had, uh, was mentored by Ed Faulkner. And Ed Faulkner was really well known um, before Van de Meer, before Braden in the 60s. Some people you know, refer to him as the best tennis teacher in the U.S. And he was uh, from the Northeast. He went to Cornell. I remember he, he just took classes that would he thought would make him a better tennis teacher. But I don't think in 87 there was all that much money um, when he first started. It was rel- relatively new and... But then, you know, his wife has a, a you know, lifetime in tennis. Kathy was a club pro for years and years. She was the president of the USPTA. She was a former director of the um, the Lake Nona tennis facility, you know, running the community side. Went to, mm-hmm. went to U10, played, played tennis. Uh, so, and then after, um, I could be wrong, but this is just from being in tennis for a long time, is um, they hired Paul Roeder, and um, Paul Anacone, it was, you know, Rotor was going to be the briefcase guy, the chief administrator, and Paul Anacone was going to be the chief of player development. I think I got that from Bobby Curtis. Was one was going to be the briefcase guy, one was going to be the ball hopper. And what happens with the pro circuit is the pro circuit, in a lot of ways, if you're at the very top, it's in one ways, it's not real world. There's so much money you know, the very top 10 players in the world. And yeah. Paul himself, I know you had a chance to meet him when he was at Seguzo Bassett mm-hmm. with, um, yeah. So when he, he was hired, it was announced that he was going to come in. You know, I heard six weeks, you know, it certainly could be embellished, but he, he did show up for six weeks once he was hired. And then when he came, he was only there for six weeks because once, um, you know, the time had gone by. Pete Sampras called him up and said, hey, can you come back and coach me? Because Pete said, well, I was going to try to do something a little bit different. And, and uh, you know, first part of the season, he didn't have Paul with him. And he called up and had uh, Paul come back. I remember meeting with Paul Anacone. You were in on this. is because, you know, he was there practicing with Patrick McEnroe. And I can remember uh, showing him... Uh, Remember the Japanese tennis magazines that had all the sequences? Yeah, I and, went through all those things, yeah. And, it, you know, it was his serve, and it might have been like, you know, I don't know how many frames. Most tennis magazines well, they, just yeah. show eight frames, but this is more like 80 frames in a magazine. The magazine yeah. was just like a small telephone book. Um, yeah, it was a great, it was a great, it was a great resource back then. No, I mean, all you got to do is, for the health of tennis is just if you were in tennis in the 70s, 
all you have to do is pick up a tennis magazine. You know, there could be a tennis magazine with two articles in the same magazine on the same topic. But also mm -hmm. the, the lack of uh, money spent on advertising and such, so the magazine's smaller. But um, Paul's brother, Steve, is, a, you know, older, and, you know, he credits his brother for helping him out so much. I met his brother because there's a family from Knoxville, Tennessee. So when Paul ended up going to Knoxville to play tennis, his brother... I think it was a Rocky Mountain or Smoky Mountain, Smoky Mountain Academy. There's a family that came to see me and they just, and, and then Steve handled it really well. They went back and they said, Hey, we just need court time now. And they did their own thing. And then when I met with him, he said, I respect what these kids are doing. I just want to know how'd you get them to do it? And that was the video process and this, that, and the other thing. And three, th three boys and the, the parents, uh, they, they did it on their own. and But I can remember the ATP University back in the day. Mm -hmm. you know, this goes back 30 years ago. It was really teaching people on the tour how to make money after tennis. And it's completely different now. The ATP University teaches them how to manage their money. It doesn't talk to them about a post-career. It talks to them about a, how to handle their career and how to manage their money now. Um, but I you know Paul, he had respect for the, the tennis teaching pro, um, the, uh, but no, he had done, he had done some things with the LTA, but to Rotard, he was, um, you know, he, three, three different times. And, and again, this is just, uh, from the outside being an outsider, um, you know, there really could be some research on this, but he, um, he spent some time around getting aerial. So when I was a gopher, go for the pencil, go for the clipboard for Vic Braden, Gideon Ariel was his partner, computer scientist, biomechanist. You know, he's been a guest on our podcast. Amazing, amazing. What, how they both he helped each other out back in the, in the seventies, Vic Braden, Gideon Ariel. So, um, I believe it was Fullerton, but, um, I think his degree is from Connecticut, but his, his final degree is PhD. He has a PhD in in biomechanics, but he was with the USDA, then he left, and then he went to human kinetics. Um, you remember the outfit in Champagne? They used to produce all the videos and books and such. Yeah, yeah. So that was in Champagne, and that's where uh, we first had Jennifer Roberts go from our program, and then Craig Tiley from our program. And so he was USDA, then he was human kinetics, and then he left, and then he... Um, was a, was a corporation where they were trying to help out, you know, schools with, with health, health-based projects. I think shape, I have down here, Shape America. Um, but now he's back, and I think the title's changed where he was with USTAU, United States Tennis Association University. So that's close to you and me because they were trying to set up programs where you get a college degree. Mm -hmm. So... He actually he was born into tennis. He's Dutch. His father was a leader of the Davis Cup team, the Dutch Davis Cup team. And um, just, just going through his bio briefly, he five books he's written and 25 different books he's written chapters with, but now his title is Special Projects. So there's been, um, again, this is from the outside, Talk to some used to people and I say, no, he's wrong, wrong, wrong. But there's been so many people that passed through the door since 87. I was, when Einstein says, uh, you only know your subject if you know the history of your subject. But I do think there needs to be a critical study. You're saying about okay, the GPS, where, where are you going? But uh, where have you been? You know, you got to yeah. learn from the past, deal with the present, and go towards the future with... Um, but, yeah, so... I've, with with uh, Paul Roder, um, he was there with no Paul Anacone. And um, this is an interesting story with a um, great guy, very, and you know, I've spent very little time with him, but, you know, very easy to like. I mean, um, so Rob Krychek, father of Austin Krychek, who you know both of them, he, uh, and she, along with his wife, Sherry, Austin, I don't think he's got a, an enemy in the world, really nice guy. And he's climbed, he's climbed the ladder, climbed the ladder. He's a 
Kalamazoo champion first, then he was an all American and he was top hundred in singles and he'd been as high as number one in doubles. But Paul, uh, excuse me, Rob Grychek read that Craig Tiley said that it would take him 10 years to have a network of coaches in the United States. So Rob hmm. called Paul Rodert and said that I already had a network of coaches in the United States. So uh, we met with, with Paul and three different times. And it was the first meeting, the first half of the, and the one day we were there, it was just uh, Rob, Paul, and myself. And it was so long ago, I remember taking in a, a, a duffel bag of uh, VHS tapes. And one was a clip that's on our course, Tennis Intelligence Applied. I think everyone's seen it now. At one time, I used to have all these videos that can remember uh, diff different students like yourself. I remember one student, Tom Gilly. Mm -hmm. His job was anytime tennis was on TV, he had to tape it. And I remember one piece of uh, video that we had that we lost. And just always disappointed that it, we lost this. It was like Tim Henman at age eight in a squash court. And they were teaching, and mm -hmm. he, he's just doing volleys. He's just doing volleys. And he was, if people go back, I mean, he was so good. He was such a complete, yeah. such a complete player. Uh, but this clip of uh, um, Pete Sampras. So I'm showing the, the clip to Paul. And I remember we had a, the second meeting and there was Paul Rodert and Paul Lubbers and Ann Pankhurst. They were, not, you know, his um, go-to people. They were his the people that were helping. They were close to, closest to what he was doing day to day. And that's where the USTA was um, you know, the different size tennis courts. And then, you know, we had the 36 foot court, which no one even talks about anymore, the 60 foot mm -hmm. court and the 78 foot court. And there was a poster, it was called stage development. And I just asked Paul in a meeting with Rob, I said, could you tell me just a ballpark, what it cost to make that poster and have it be put on like every tennis facility in America. And, you know, he just smiled. He said, a lot of money. And I said, well, I'd be very critical of the photos that are in, that are on that poster. I said, anybody who knows anything about tennis teaching would not put that poster up. Now, jumping all over the place, I remember being in a meeting with a number of teaching pros. It was Jose Garris. And again, we haven't said enough about Jose, but he started from nothing and climbed his way to number six in the world. And, you know, he, um, at that pro level, I mean, he was coaching Michael Chang when he was 17, he won the French. Jim Courier speaks so highly of him. You know, why wouldn't he? Because of the famous rain rain delay where he talks to Courier and he says, um, you know, whatever the back advice up. was, what do you say, back up on the return against that? I guess he, he said back, back up on the return, yeah. And, I mean, and Andre was a much better ball striker. You know, that's where we could get into the grips. What we do is a courier basically on his left hand, he has grip on four. So as a right-hander, what happens, he has to pull that racket back into his body. And it does. He, he started off being a really good baseball player. He, um, I had a chance to, you know, spend time with his sister, Audra. You guys have to keep me on track here. Keep going back and round and round. But... She said that when he lost his first term, he cried for three straight days. And then the mother, Linda, um, with, uh, we used to do some things for the Couriers uh, Foundation where we would teach for a week. You know, these ladies would come out and usually, we, you know, we're just working with juniors. But, you know, Jim Curry ever listens to his podcast is that Danielle, she was playing like all these different sports. She ended up playing, I think, at Oregon, but she was so talented. She, you know, she didn't do the hard yards like he did. I mean, he went to Hopman's before he went to Volunteer's at mm -hmm. age 12. So, yeah, so he's held in such high esteem by coaching Michael Chang, coaching Courier. Then at one point he was working with Federer. Um, the, uh, coming back to the photos on this poster, 
uh, in this meeting, I said, well, what we should do, I was just asked, I said, what do we need to do to improve American tennis? I said, we should have form tournaments and target tournaments. We should up, put up posters like, okay, here's Serena's unit turn on the forehand, or this is her movement where her palms down on her serve, you know, and put pictures of the Fed and, and, and how, you, you know, we used to do that, have foam with you, I have form tournaments. Kids will do anything yeah. for, for a prize when they're seven, eight years old. Had put them on teams and, and you know, just Dennis Vandermeer trickery. And the other thing is targets, you know, from basketball. You know, that kid, is, if he was in a rowboat, he couldn't put the ball in the ocean. And, you know, kids, mm -hmm. you know, people have heard us on these podcasts talk about our skills test. Okay, we're going to feed you a forehand volley. Here it comes, 30 miles an hour. Could you hit it in this area called the service box, the diagonal cross court service box? Um, it's 13 and a half by 21. It's bigger than your bedroom. Can you get the ball in that box? And then they can't because of the way they're hanging on the racket, you know, stream grip, open racket face grip. The, as they say, I found out in England, the chopper grip with, uh, but anyway, coming back to a second meeting is I remember Ann Pank Pankers, who had a lot to do with Judy Murray and held in high esteem. She was really into, um, you, you can't skill test a 10 year old on a full size court. So I'm playing this tape and, um, you know, she's watching it and, you know, it's, it's, it goes through a cycle. It plays over and over again. It's Sampras sitting in a forehand approach shot, forehand volley, a two hand mm -hmm. backhand volley and overhead. And it's Robert Lanzer going, little Petey, he's faster than lightning. And then she says to me, is that your son? Because at that time, mm -hmm. uh, you know, my sons were pretty highly ranked in Florida. One of them was, uh, I always tell people, we must be doing some right because one was number one in the tens and one was number one in the 18s. And, um, so I, I just, I knew where she was coming from instantly. And so I let her ask me a second time, is that your son? I said, no, no, it's Pete Sampras. It was like, ba boom. So you, you, you can, te you can test a 10 year old on a, on a 78 foot court. That's the one point of many from Wayne Bryan's letter is that, you know, the 10 and under initiative, you know, his thing basically is well, you're four years too late. It's, you know, what you're, what you're putting together is that's what six year olds should do. Mm -hmm. Um, why don't you make a few comments on the uh, red, orange, and green? Rogi, they call it. Well, I mean, I it was fun to get another look at Wayne Bryan's letter. Um, I mean, my, my feelings have been very similar to that my whole life. Um, you know, he wrote that some time ago. When, the, when they started to mandate everything, I, I think that the different balls um, have a purpose. I mean, champions like Sampras and, and Andre and, and Chang and people that we were just referencing, they uh, they didn't hit compression balls necessarily. Um, they played tennis with tennis balls. And um, I think I've told you before, I, I find myself using the compression balls for when kids are coming out of injury and things like that. And I'll, and I'll, uh, or when they're in the crawl walk run phase of, uh, making some major technical changes in their game. Um, and sometimes I'll use them with people uh, that are very advanced and just to help create, you know, uh, efficient racket speed and really, you know, just learn to swing at the ball. And I like, you know, that you can see the rotation on the ball a little easier on some of them. Um, but I think to, to, to Wayne Bryant's point, I mean, yeah, me, let's use, let's use that as a tool. Let's just use those balls as another tool, but not a, not a, uh, across the board mandate that these are, these are how kids are going to play tennis in the, in the early stages. I mean, there's, you know, there, you go all the way back to forever ago. I mean, whether it, and, and graduated length method has been a part of the sport forever. It's not a new thing. The, the Wilson, Mr. Pee Wee rackets that were branded back in the, mid eighties or whenever that was. And I know Vandermeer was a huge proponent of graduated length, but I think the way that it's just been mandated is, you know, and, and people complained and people voiced that. I mean, is there a more powerful voice for that subject than, than Wayne Bryan with the success of his two kids? I don't know, but um, it seemed to fall on deaf ears. It's almost like, you know, 
just let people keep on knocking and, and eventually they'll stop. That, that's kind of the attitude that I, I feel uh, they've taken at that level. And I'm sure, you know, there, there's a lot of knocking. I'm sure there's a lot of complaining, a lot of, a lot of uh, people that are, are voicing similar things. And I, I feel like it just kind of gets shoved to the side. But I think those balls are a good tool. But I don't think they're uh, necessarily for what, what they're being used for right now. No, I think old tennis balls. Um, Tyler Junior College. Um, what was the guy's name? It was Ball Yule Brenner. I think Brandon came yeah. one time and said, "Ah, oh, Yule Brenner Clinic." The the, the, mm-hmm. the the tennis balls were balls. So it always had some some humor. But uh, coming around to so many things, money. When I was at Tyler Junior College. The budget we had for the entire school year was a little bit less, not much, but a little bit less than the president's entertainment budget. You know, so one was seven thousand, one was just a little bit below that. So we had to borrow balls. I would go to Florida during the semester break. I remember one time driving back and I was in Mississippi, it's freezing. And the gentleman said, I think all your lemons are going to be frozen because my pickup was just filled with uh, all these used tennis balls that I, because I, you know, I spent a lot of time in Boca and, you know, wrote letters and said, Hey, I'm going to show up and save balls for me. Cause we they just had no money for, for balls. But you look back at something like that is that, you know, we, we tried to make something out of nothing. You know, we didn't have any, mm-hmm. any, you know, we had seven tabletop stringers with, um, Elaine Mason comes to my mind. So, you, you know, it's like Dennis uh, or say, uh, Craig O'Shaughnessy, Warren Pretorius history, you know, you can't have Bill Jacobson to be, for, be forgotten. Um, tennis books from the past, uh, Elaine Mason was really big with, um, you know, graduated length method, shortening the court, shortening the racket, shortening the stroke, three different ways. Boom, boom, boom. And yeah, so the, the transition balls are great training tools. That's in um, Wayne Bryan's letter, but yeah, not the mandate and say you, you have to, you have to hold people back, but you know, we flip it, you know, we have people actually go out and play with a phone ball and they have fun. Mm-hmm. And we tell people mm-hmm. um, about this concept called uh, light tennis. where now, Tennis players should go to pickleball courts, take a rack, take a tennis racket, and take a foam ball. Doesn't work out too well on a windy day, but you know, um, it was Kleisters, Kim Kleisters, and Justine Hennen in Belgium, where you know they came up with a slower tennis ball. Um, the rally ball, it didn't make it, but that was seven percent bigger. That only neg- yeah. only negative is it wouldn't go through a ball machine. With but there was no, so, you know, one point, one yeah. point that you just made that I'm before I, I, I can, I'm trying to write notes here with my left hand because I'm immobilized with my right. But uh, I just jotted it down. But before I forget, you know, you referenced Belgium and, and uh, kind of the, you know, how, how this, all this mandate came onto the U S with the balls, the short court, et cetera. And, and even, uh, and again, I may be out of line for even saying it, but it seems like, the USTA over my lifetime, which hasn't been as long as some, I get it, but um, over the 40 years, it just seems like they grab a little bit of a flavor of the month, even within the, the, the global tennis community, and then try to bring that to uh, the governing body, to their, to their player development. And even, and, you know, again, and I, I have never met Jose Higueras and, and, um, sat at a lunch table about 10 feet from him. That's, that's all I know him for in terms of personal interaction, but I uh, studying him and, you know, when, when the Spanish um, craze came in and um, it, it's not surprising to me that the U S hired a Spaniard um, with Spain doing so well. And, and now the way that the, the world works now, we're going to be uh, really looking hard into Italy. Um, we didn't look that hard into Russia or in some of these others as much, but, um, probably because there, there's a lot of hard work there, but I, I just feel like to some degree, this copycat syndrome as to what's working elsewhere is brought into our, our country and adopted at the player development center and then tried to, um, implement it here, um, in a totally different culture. Um, I may be wrong, but I can certainly tell you there's several 
times throughout my life where that has happened. And I think it coincides with another country doing well, this and that. And, and, uh, a copycat syndrome, I don't think is, has enough substance. It's not based on information. It's just, it's, it's a little bit of flavor of the month. No, I am glad you brought that up. You use the word crazed. So, uh, Aoife Wilson from Ireland, who was a classmate of yours, I went to Ireland um, and she arranged it. I was uh, working with the Irish coaches. And then I remember being back there another time and it, you know, that was the craze that we were gonna, we were gonna do what they're doing in Belgium. And yeah. so then a, a coach from Belgium is there. And it's like, well, gee, has this coach ever even met Justine Hennon or Kim Kleisters? Yeah. And yeah, so it's like a wow factor. Um, Andy Roddick mentioned this on his podcast because there are other, are other parts to player development that Mitchell Kruger had sent him a message, you know, like mm -hmm. text, twit, Twitter, whatever. What's that called now? It's called X? X, yeah. X, yeah. And, um, you know, in Italy, they have tons of tournaments. You know, actually in Spain at one time, I believe they had 50 step up tournaments, the, the futures where they're ten, fifteen thousand dollars. Well the economy yeah. is really bad. So, you know, I think that's where like say an American kid, there's so much hype. They go to the Eddie Hur and there's all the flags. And you tell the parents, you know, the twelves and fourteens is just a USD tournament. It is open, mm -hmm. but it's 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 not an ITF tournament. And then you know, I spent a lot of time in Europe and the co the, the countries that have the least amount of money just generally have the best players. It's like the question that Jack Kramer was asked year, years ago by the French. We have an excellent system for play, but the French uh, representative from the French Tennis Federation said to Kramer, um, we're spending more money than anybody. Why aren't we developing champions? And Kramer said, smart, smart guy. Um, he said, your answer is in the question. You know, mm -hmm. you, know you just, you can't just throw money at the problem either. So, um, but that's where, you know, you can go to, you know, say a 12 and 14 under tournament over here in the U S and yes, well, well, yeah, there's, you know, where, where are the players from? So it's really, is it really an international tournament? Um, but I think with, well, and go ahead. you hit on it with, it with Italy, you hit on it and, you know, Roddick in that podcast talks about it. And, uh, uh, coach Andreas is good friend, Carlos, um, Abiza was Brent Venezuelan number one junior there that worked here for us for four or five years and did a great job that, you know, he, he's gone on, he's not coaching tennis anymore, but somewhere around, you know, 2020, he, he started talking about it. He was a heck of a player, uh, even while teaching full time, you know, solid 13 plus UTR kind of player. And he, uh, he, I remember him bringing this up that Spain was, or that Italy was making this move positioning themselves with, uh, you know, the, the, the first and second tier tournaments all over Italy. And, uh, you know, coach George, um, is headed to Europe on Friday and he was, he had been over there once already this year. And he, he was talking about how, I mean, it basically he'd have to buy a couple of train passes for a year and he'd be able to play pro tennis between two or three countries and get the points We're here, you know, it's, it's, it can bankrupt you when you're trying to travel out of Dallas and, and you're at his level where you have to play challengers and, and do it frequently. And, you know, he's got to, he's got to basically uh, live on the road for you in Europe for quite some time to get the job done. But I think they just, I, I love Roddick's point about why doesn't the USTA center and Nona just simply hold 25 events. I mean, it, 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 some of the things are just sort of common sense. And listen, we've all thought the same thing. I mean, you want to help American tennis have, have futures and challengers held right on site there. And, uh, you know, people can utilize the training facilities in the off days and when they get beat and, and, uh, they don't have to spend money on airplanes and getting back in and out. It just, things aren't as complicated, I think, as we're making them, um, and, and the, the people that are making these or not making these decisions, whether they're making them or not making the decisions to make these things happen, I think there, there does have to be unbelievable accountability. And, you know, like I said, I think that there's, they've adopted an attitude where 
uh, you know, when, when people are coming with to the door knocking, I think they just, they just, you know, it's kind of like when you were a kid and you're like, Hey, pretend no one's home. And, uh, eventually they'll go away. And I, I feel like that's what the USCA has done over the years with all of this. And, uh, those are my thoughts. For, for the listeners, uh, Dave's referring to George Goldoff, who, um, seven years in Tibet, he had to spend seven years with us or seven months with us, uh, with, with COVID. Um, when you give us an update, how's he doing with his tennis? He's doing well. He, uh, you know, I think he, uh, looking forward to Europe. He won a few challengers, had a rough, rough patch down in Mexico on the altitude in the red clay. Um, had to cut it short, got a little bit of, uh, infection down there and food poisoning. So, but he's been up training. Um, it's inspiring because for the kids, I think, you know, tomorrow morning he'll be out there at seven right along the kids in the Academy. And, and what I, you know, George is, a rare breed in that way. I remember talking to you once about Baghdadis and how, you know, when he was already top 10 in the world and he'd go back to his academy and do fitness with the kids. And that's what George reminds me of. I mean, no, I he's like, a, Hey, I'll, gr- I'll grab anybody and do whatever. Oh, I see. Yeah. My son and I were at Patrick Mortigola's place where it was when he was outside of Paris and it was on a farm and there's all these hills and, uh, go, Connor, you know, that guy's top 10 of the world. He's, he's running those hills with you guys. With uh, um, doubles, actually, for an American player like George, years ago, you go to Europe, and the Europeans didn't do that well in doubles in comparison to the Americans. You know, you go back to, mm-hmm. you know, Braden used to talk about how the South Americans, Europeans were really good with their feet because of football. I mean, international football, soccer. And the Americans were good because of baseball and um, football throwing, but they were also h- hard courts. But now it's uh, doubles is played very poorly everywhere. I mean, it's it's yeah, it's amazing. Um, you know, it's just with uh, Rajiv Ram. Well, Thierry. George and his partner, George and his partner Trotter, who went to Ohio State, like your son. I mean, they played very conventional doubles, and both are really good at it. But they essentially lost to two guys who were just uh, playing singles on half the court and just nuking forehands. You know. Uh, Adam, you know, at altitude and um, sometimes skill, skill doesn't always, uh, prevail. Yeah. I've said this before. Uh, you, you were there when we helped working with Alvin Marario and his daughter and, um, you know, the two, the way two William sisters, you know, who wins, um, the superior athletes with the inferior system or the inferior athletes with a superior system and typically, yeah. typically the athletes are going to win. But with George, I think also too, too, too many people are, uh, hopefully George can get there one day where he's talking about the ATP pension. Those are some numbers. I don't think he's like a lot of American tennis players are talking about fantasy football, but coming back to analytics, um, you know, the people that are launching missiles, it's too bad that the people are volleying, trying to volley with a racket face. It's open at 45 degrees too. I mean, Mm-hmm. That, that's where if people really know basics, I mean, I would say it this way, if you don't know basics, I mean, you're really just masquerading as, well, yeah, I'm a, I'm, I'm a, I'm a, a strategy expert. If you don't know strokes, you don't know strategy. I mean, certainly up to a certain point. Um, but, um, no, I remember, uh, Tom Gullickson saying that, uh, we've lost our identity with the Spanish craze. You know, we're, we're basically growing up on hard courts and, uh, maybe we'll get a time to read this spoof. Um, the spoof is only, uh, let's see here, 781 words. Maybe we could look go through that. But with, yeah, so Tom Gully, uh, I certainly knew his brother Tim very well, but I remember one time being uh, on the tour with my son Connor, and I said, uh, Gully, I'm surprised you still have your job. You can't speak Spanish. Because at one time, it was like, they, how, how many Spanish-speaking coaches were they hiring? And I think you'd have to go back, but at one time, um, I correct American kids all the time, so, oh, he's Spanish. I said, no, no, no. You have to be from Spain to be Spanish. You're Ecuadorian, you know, you're Argentine. You're, um, but um, here's something I have in my notes. Uh, it's a conversation I remember having with Paul Roder. He goes, no, I would never tell, I would never bring that up. I was asked by Dave Fish if I could be 
in like two days time, could I, uh, I was at Kalamazoo, could I stay for this meeting? And I said, no, I just, you know, I promised people I've, you know, they're going to be in Tampa when I get back and I've got to be in Tampa groups coming in and, um, I've got to be there. So, but it was, um, Patrick McEnroe had been hired. He went to Kalamazoo and he, he was a smooth operator, a New York, New Yorker. And he was, had the pad of paper saying, ask anybody, what do you think we should do? What do you think we should do? And everybody's writing, he's writing things down. And, and, you know, the, the beat up on Patrick was that people didn't think that he'd ever even given a lesson before, you know, and he's now that he's general manager of player development. And, you know, then, um, he was living, I believe it's out on the island, uh, out towards the Hamptons, Oyster Bay, I think it's the name of the town. You know, so well, how can the general manager of player development the headquarters or they were in Miami, but by the time he was hired, they were in Boca. So how could you be, in, be at home? Um, but Dave Fish for the longest time, former coach at Harvard said the two biggest problems with American tennis is competition and then instruction. And um, how I ended up um, working for Harvard, their tennis camp, is the, the women's coach, Gordon Graham, was on site to uh, recruit one of our players. So I remember we took, you know, the five, six coaches and we, we sat on the picnic table under the trees and I would just blow the whistle and practice was running while the coaches being on the court. And he didn't say anything, really quiet guy, soft-spoken gentleman class act. So he goes back and fishes his partner at the Harvard tennis camp. And, um, so they call me up and say, we'd like to have you come and, um, be part of our tennis camp. And, you know, Wayne Bryan had been there as many, you know, well-known people, they would bring somebody in. And I said, you know, I've done that for a long time, those traveling workshops. And we're talking about doing traveling workshops again, but can we raise enough money to be able to film, do the, do the workshops the right way and try to reach more people? Because I used to say it's you know it's like yeah it's like putting uh, sugar on sugar cereal you know you go and talk to somebody for two three days it's just not enough. Braden used to say, yeah I talked to fifty people, I fit I, I uh, covered fifty points, and they interpreted fifty different ways. Do the math. You know to really train mm -hmm. to really train a coach. It's like you can't do it in a weekend. You know I mean I spent so many times so many years going to conferences, so. You know, Dave's fish, articulate, well-spoken guy. I, I was really su surprised he uh, said it in our podcast. I'm pretty sure that's where I heard him say it. I mean, I'm sure I've heard him say it more than once, but um, beats up the USTA. He said, well, because he's, again, diplomatic. He said, that's where good ideas go to die. And, um, but you, so you, you can't really spend just a couple of days with someone. I do think when uh, Paul, excuse me, uh, Rob Krychek, Paul wrote was so gracious and that, you know, that he wanted us to work, wanted us to work with the national coaches. I'm sure in his mind, he was thinking that we would just do it for one day. In my mind was like, that won't work because, you know, just how much time you need and, you know, they're at a different level. You know, they're coaching, the horse has been out of the barn for a while. You know, they're coaching, mm -hmm. they're, they're, co they're not coaching, you know, they're, you know, Wayne Bryan term, they're cherry picking, they're coaching kids who can already play. And, um, but you know, I, so what happened with Harvard is I said, why don't you send your camp director down here? So, um, Cheyenne Hawk came down and he's a brilliant guy and he's, he called up and said, this isn't enough. So he ended up coming back and he spent 17 days with us before the summer started. And, you know, we have like, you have a manual for your program that we talked about, Cheyenne put a program together for the Harvard tennis camp. In fact, I think of uh, Jackie Calla, who's coaching at Syracuse now. You know, mm -hmm. She was 10 years old and um, went with me. And, you know, she did all the demos, all the demos. And I have no problem going, well, actually, the way she hits the ball, she's more efficient than any of the guys and gals on the team. Doesn't mean that she's, you know, she ended up uh, playing tennis at Amherst and loves the game and, you know, there was a, f a few years there with, with injuries and circumstances where she wasn't playing, but um, great story in tennis. But so with competition, the, U the UTR, Fish, um, Dave Howell put that together, math-wise. It's based off the French system. Dave Fish wrote the famous white paper and just 
pushed it and pushed it and pushed it. And then it hasn't really gone the way that he wanted to, where it was supposed to be self-rating. It was supposed to be genderless and ageless. And now they have the largest tennis email list in the world, and it's mega money. You know, the, what, mm-hmm. what, what people are paying for tournaments. There's a lot of positives. I think one thing that um, is taking place now is the money tournaments with the UTR. Because big problem in American tennis is, and all the problems, you can't blame the USTA, but um, one problem is the, uh, the kid who gets out of college, and the, where do they go? They're not going to play pro tennis. They're good, but they're not going to play pro tennis. So um, they start banging golf balls. You know, now they're going to start banging pickleballs. And that's what the, that, the one thing about the club system in Europe that allows people to keep staying in the game. So now that there's money UTRs, hopefully that will uh, keep people going. But we, we also have to give more money to the players. Um, that comes back to the point with how much money is spent on the executive staff, how much money is spent on the players. And the English stopped doing it, but I loved, the, loved it when the English, um, the LTA, if a kid won $1,500 at a future, they would match it with $1,500. I mean, I know I have a son who played pro tennis for three years. It's a war of financial attrition. Mm-hmm. You know, my son Connor, one time he won both uh, um, a singles and a doubles. So I said, yeah, so I asked my son, uh, $1,800. So I said, how much would you get paid for the doubles? And he said, I, would, I wish you didn't do the asset. That's what he got paid for both. But uh, to improve, in, in, you said it, to improve instruction, um, you know, that's, you know, to get people on the same page where, where it's unified. Um, with, um, yeah, Steve, I, I think that, you know, listening, re- rereading all these letters, uh, reading Javier Palenque's, reading Wayne Bryan's, um, uh, going through the letter that you uh, sent on to the USTA uh, when they were considering Craig Tiley. Um, you know, it, uh, listening to Roddick's podcast and, and to me, a lot of, I mean, if I, you know, if you, if you just had to pick, okay, where, where are you going to fire your, shoot your arrows? I mean, I would do two things. It would be trying to have, I mean, we, we have a shortage of people getting into tennis. We know that coaches, people that aren't, uh, as excited coming into the, to come into the tennis business, which I think is a shame because it's an unbelievable um, career path. But I think that there needs to be a better systematic way to train people and for, for this career in tennis. Um, there needs to be more quality um, in what's coming through the door right from the beginning. There needs to be uh, a more professional approach to it. And, and again, nothing against the USPTA. I know they recently hired a new guy and uh, worked here for many years under Noni Machelka um, at Canyon Creek and best of luck to him. But it, it needs to be more than it is. If that, if the USPTA is going to be the route, it needs to be more than it is. It needs to have something attached to it, like the great base, not like the great base, but that type of system that's based on information that's based on true, uh, science, biomechanics, a lot of unbelievable tennis teachers who have given their life to it, who this generation really doesn't even know, um, but have the proven results. And it's not like the game is modernized to where it's not relevant. And then the second arrow that I think needs to be shot is from the grassroots levels up to the pro levels, getting the tournament system right because the tournament system is really messed up in junior tennis. And in, uh, I think what, what Andy Roddick's point, I mean, regarding the, the, the futures and the challengers. And I think that if they were to shoot two arrows in those directions and hit and put a lot of resources into it and get a lot of feedback from people outside of committee. Um, you know, Wayne Bryan in his letter talks about how, in SoCal, I mean, at the sectional championships now, I mean, you, you and I have been in this forever and 
nobody even takes pride in winning sectionals anymore. Here in Texas, they dressed it up. Now it's called the Slam. And I told the kids, <laughs> they did it, I don't know how many years ago, but I said, do not say the word Slam on my court. It, it's, it's just, it's sectional. But now, and, and he talked about it even when he wrote this letter years ago, how uh, out of the top 20 in SoCal, only one junior, um, out of the top 20 even played the, the, the SoCal tournament. And, and he said in Bob and Mike's era, 20, it was 20 for 20 because that was the only way they got endorsed to go to Kalamazoo. And it used to be the same here. You remember when Andy Roddick's brother, John, was playing uh, the sectional tournament up there. And immediately at the end of the sectionals up in Wichita Falls, Dean Barrett, who was the head of the ranking committee, would go into his office and print out and then post it on the wall. And, and that would tell who basically got endorsed for clay courts in Kalamazoo. And by the way, everybody had to play their own age group in order to get endorsed for that age group back then as yeah. well. Part of Wayne's uh, letter was uh, the USTA at one point. And there's always two sides of the story. There's a positive and negative, negative, positive. They dropped the rankings for the 12s. And so yeah. the, the two twins just played in the 14s. Um, you know, to, to, that was one point it's just you don't want to hold people back you know if someone's good enough to be playing tournaments in the 12s more power to them bobby curtis who i've mentioned a few times he was when the usta just had they had hard courts clay courts and indoor that was it there wasn't level two nationals level three nationals that becomes the you know 2500 hundred dollar t-shirt by the time the parents fly and length of the tournament uh, get off the airplane, rent a car, check in the hotel. It's just too much money being spent. Um, with systems, so um, system of in tournaments, you know, we say we have a system of systems and we have a system on how we put a grip stick around. We have a system on how we film people. You know, just this is how we do it. This is, a, you know, I think the NFL would be a very good place to turn to is, a, you know, where are they systematic? Um, so, with Wayne is the red ball, orange dot and orange and green dot. Is that a system? Or then with Jose and I do, I do think people love Jose Garris and I think there's a lot to be said for that. You know, such a great tennis mind. Well, you know, helping Jim Courier or Michael Chang when they're already, you know, on their way to world-class tennis, you know, that's, that's a different part of, tennis versus okay the entry point when people are early childhood development so my question you can comment on it is it a different color balls is that a system and then jose was that it's the eyes first then it's the mind then it's the feet then it's the hands and to me okay that's that's so we can we can work off of that you have to work with recognition skills can the people analyze to anticipate um you know the you know, you have to get people ready mentally. It's so many different, so many different chapters. And then obviously footwork. Almost every time you look at a match, you know, I, I mean, I was watching for Andy Fitzell today. I watched a match with uh, Diana Schneider and so many things, you know, she played really well and a lot of, a lot of positives. She went 47% of the points, so she's in on it. But it's like, okay, footwork and more footwork, adjustment steps. Um now, a lot of people don't think that we would say that because when people are sent to us, uh, you know, a tennis player has, you know, the three sections, you know, from their uh, neck up, from the neck to the waist, and then the waist down. And when, when people come to us, I mean, so obviously the grip, the swing is that, you know, and obviously you have to deal character, but we're dealing with, you know, not part one, the mental part, not part three, the, the footwork, we're dealing with part two. And part two is a train wreck. You know, the light at the end of the tunnel is a train coming right at the kid. Um, with uh, one thing I want to say about Wayne, Brian, Pied Piper, um, you know, where he says, play, play, play. That's so important. But his, his son, Bob, said on the Tennis Channel, he said, well, my dad gets really pumped up, really excited. He goes, but our mom worked with our strokes every day after school. You know, and they, you know, and Wayne does say, say that as well. He thinks if hey, it wasn't for Vic Braden, my kids would uh, be bagging groceries, which isn't true, but, it's, you know, it's a compliment to Vic. He also says that about Tyriac and 
um, Nastasi, the Romanian doubles trails. You know, if you ever get a chance to watch um, the Brian brothers practice, I mean, so many of the drills are from Tyriac and Nastasi. But um, so, yeah, you, you know, I think a lot of times you just really have to be around it for a long time. But it, that's one thing with the Vic Braden Library. Within that library, and the Tennis Channel now has digitized all of it, is there's there's got to be film of the Brian brothers when they were little kids. There's film of them when they were older with both Vic and Andy, but there's film of them when they were little kids. Um, with um, USBTA PTR, um, so when Paul Roeder, you know, we went to meet with him, and this, the story progresses. Well, he, he was in charge for some time, and Patrick came in. What I did was I, I mean, I went through the USPTA and PTR and, and got audio tapes of, you know, Ann Pankhurst and Paul Lever's presentations. And, you know, okay, this is what they're doing. And um, with, you know, but what a lot of people don't realize that what, what we're doing is just really the homework from people that have gone before us. And I, you know, I've said it a hundred times on this podcast, your, your statement, uh, back to the future, back to the future. Mm -hmm. So, um, with Patrick, um, it's, it's public domain. So if people wanted to follow Javier Palenque, um, you know, again, he writes something every day and he is just, he does his homework and it's public domain. I mean, as I said earlier, it's public dollars. Patrick was paid a million dollars and he's a Stanford graduate. All three boys, his brother, Mark's a lawyer. John played so well, he just went for one year. And um, I'll go off on a John McEnroe tangent. You ready? So John McEnroe, he's, he's 20 in the world by the time he goes to Stanford. He's got the semis of Wimbledon. And the girls were ignoring him. And uh, so John, John McEnroe, being John McEnroe, said, 90% um, of the girls in California are gorgeous. The other 10% go to Stanford. <laughs> so he was getting back at the Stanford girls that weren't given any time. So I was telling that story to a group of juniors one time. And one junior said to the other one, my mother went to Stanford. And the other junior said, is she, <laughs> is she ugly? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, so Jay Berger, amazing story, you know, great player. Speed of the backswing has nothing to do with power supply. His serve was not as unorthodox as you think, but he played with that Kmart racket, or he, he played with that old Prince racket forever. He was top ten, mm -hmm. top ten in the world. What a gamer, and you know, survived the the Chuck Creasy workouts. But when he, so he was there, then there was quite a few coaches from uh, Clemson. He played at Clemson. And, you know, okay, we named th three, four, five. I, I, I bet on five. You know, then Patrick was hired. I bet on the same number. A lot of players were, people were hired from Stanford. It's like with college coaching. It amazes me that college coaches, you know, not totally, but they hire their former players. Well, I can see if they hire a former player, the kid was just on time. They're just a walking example. You know, they're a great role model. But, you know, what are, what new are they going to bring to the table? They were part of your system for four years and you're bringing them as an assistant. But I, I don't think in tennis, we, we think, all right, who's coaching the University of Georgia? Who's coaching football? Who's coaching the University of Clemson? You know, they all, they, who, who worked for Nick Saban in the coaching tree? I think Bill Walsh probably has the best coaching tree, the late Bill Walsh. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, it, it's understandable to a point because we all talk to people who we know. So, Patrick, uh, he, he brings in Jose, and then Jose brings in people that he knows. And, um, you know, like, you know, what, what's been the longevity, what's been the production um, with um, Patrick McEnroe, I heard just this week doing a little bit of homework for this podcast, is that he was asked about um, the USTA. And now they have all this success, you know, TFO, Tommy Paul, um, Taylor Fritz. And if you do your homework, and that's where Andy fits out, Andy, not Andy fits out, Andy Roddick, senior moment. Andy Roddick touched upon that in his podcast. Well, if you really mm -hmm. do the homework, how much time did they really spend with the USTA? And, you know, it's like Pagula and Navarro are now 
playing for UST, USA. USTA, USA, one, one thing. They're both the same thing in many ways. Um, yeah, so where do we go from here? Um, the, why do you pick up this? And I, I, we, we can go through this one, uh, one letter, but what do you well, have from here? Go ahead. Yeah, I, I think, and I haven't listened to it in, it, in, in its entirety, but it seemed like Rod had kind of danced away from it, um, you know, a little bit when he was talking about that very thing. It Again, it's, it's not even a shot at the USTA. And, you know, I, I, I think that it's a political organization, obviously, and anybody that gets inside of it, I think, is going to have their hands tied. Um, because the mandates that we're feeling on a, uh, a national, you know, level, you know, here in Dallas, Texas, I think that if somebody's working in that center, uh, I don't think they're going to have the autonomy to go out and do what they think is best for a player. And again, I mean, going back to a quote of Wayne Bryant, I mean, you, you don't, tennis players aren't going to come from Wall Street. They're coming from local courts, local pros, um, you know, inspiration from college matches, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, uh, but I think that all of the people, whether, you know, Fritz, Paul, TFO, you know, Corda, Opelka, all those people. I mean, to me, it isn't any different than the way that maybe they, uh, hang their, you know, their attachment to those players, it's no different than uh, some of the academies and or um, places around the country when somebody shows up to practice and then their picture's on the wall. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's a false representation of really uh, what it is. Uh, you know, what, what, what those players are today, I think, is, uh, you know, not necessarily a representation of the USDA player development. And and to be honest with you, I mean, I think if it were, if you start looking at some of the mechanical flaws in a few of the players and, and maybe their lack of tactical development that could really cost them from being the best they could be in their career. Um, I think then you, you could look at, uh, <laughs> look at it from that end too. Do you want to claim it? Because, uh, you know, I mean, I think we all would agree that if, you know, anybody listening, that if John Isner at age 10, you know, was playing doubles on a, on a very consistent basis through his life and he was going forward on every serve in doubles and, and, and working skill sets where he had the ability to block a return and, and move up and uh, that he, he, he probably would have even been a, a more, accomplished player than he was and, and I, I, I not to take anything away from him but it's all how you look at it I think what lenses you're looking at it um, through probably affects how you see it for sure um, but uh, I think you know just because somebody's great doesn't mean they couldn't have been better with uh, John Isner though let me go up through that uh, Matt Clore is basically the same age he grew up in North Carolina you know they certainly don't know each other from way back when. And then, you know, then it's like, are you, are you going to ask Roger Federer what he was doing when he was eight? You have to ask his mother and father. I mean, that, I think that's one of the powerful things that Roddick could do on his podcast is that he's going to interview Lynette and Robert Federer. You know, tell us what you did when he was really young. And, you know, because Roger, he, he wouldn't know like they would. But, you mm -hmm. know, uh, with Isner, uh, the older brother is playing basketball. Manny Diaz has said on our podcast, I mean, I asked him. John Isner serves and stays back. Um, John Isner improved so much, but he, you know, he was, he didn't have refined technique. I know people who uh, worked with him as a junior, worked with him in college and worked with him on the pro tour. Um, Mike Sell, I it was with Mike Sell. He said, I saw your video on John Isner's backhand volley. And I said, uh Oh, and uh, he goes, I agreed with everything on it. But, but when we, you know, we're not taking shots at a John Isner. He's probably one of the most liked no, people no. on the planet. But Isner, um, it's kind of what if. It's coming back to say Tommy Paul, Taylor Fritz, 
and Francis Tiafo. <coughs> well, how much time do they spend with the USTA? And then also, not not saying we want to we want to change their game, but um, if you could, just like with a Coco Golf, you know that that's where the, that's where the education has to come in. And you know everybody you know is talking. She's three in the world. I mean, Coco Golf is great, great, great. Um, but really, with um, at one point the USTA, they didn't bring in uh, Rajiv Ram. And I think he was one in the world at the time. At that time, one or two with Joel Salisbury. That they didn't bring him in to play Davis Cup, and they had Jack Sock, and they had the other three that I mentioned. And well, that doesn't mm -hmm. make, that doesn't make sense. Well, in one way, you could turn around and go, yeah, it does, because if you know you have three guys who play one up, one back doubles. But and you know, hopefully, one of those three or all of those three end up winning a major. But from the service line in, and then you know, that's where you can be an insider with. Um, you, you went with me to um, Toronto one time, uh, and yeah. it was uh, it's Taylor Harry Fritz, Harry's his uncle, and you know Richard Hernandez and Harry at the time. Uh, you know Richard was saying, you know, this is how the racket face should be at the impact, and Harry was saying this is how the racket face should be at the impact, and and Richard was let go because he wasn't supporting the director. He said, "I'm teaching this way," and then what happened with that? is the members they had richard reinstated and all these years later um it wasn't too long ago that richard was in california and he hooked up with harry and then they met, went to meet with the dad and you're talking about yeah he, he could uh taylor could improve his volume ability you know, matt clore who's traveled a little bit with him and practiced with him said he's the second most competitive person in america as far as tennis is concerned he said the coco golf is first and he goes, I love Taylor Fritz. He goes, he just goes, yeah, I can't volley, but I'm just going to hit the ball right through you. And but so it's not a matter of um, saying, okay, you know, we got to go back to the drawing board with these guys. But it, like in the future, I remember telling Paul Roder, missed meeting with him. I said, you wouldn't want the, the, the uh, Sam queries of the future to volley with his technique. And then I started talking about one, two, three, four, and you know, Paul Lovers and Ann Kent Pankers were in the room and they're looking cross-eyed. But um Paul Roder, he was on the inside enough to know that, you know, he knew Braden methodology or he knew Bra Braden lingo. Um with uh let me do this uh just for some fun here. Uh why don't you read this, Yvonne? Nice and loud. Um, a little spoof. Uh Patrick McEnroe. It's us uh, two types of New Yorkers, Hicks and Slicks. I'm a, I'm a Slick. He's a Hick. No. I'm a Hick, and he's a Slick. With um, He has still has three jobs. He's got his TV job. He's working in the Macro Academy. And he's, you know, he's taken over for Todd Martin at the International Tennis Hall of Fame. But let's just have a little commercial break for this one. I use it loud. All right. An old story. A politically incorrect story. The story is a spoof covering Patrick McEnroe and his three jobs. TV commentator, manager of player development, and Davis Cup captain. Hat trick, mistake I know. Once upon a time, there was a famous young brother that was given the first name Hat trick. It was not his birth name, but rather a nickname based on how he had magically pulled off having three golden jobs all at the same time. Three goals is a hat trick. His last name was Mistake I Know, pronounced Mistake I Know. He was the captain, the guardian, and the talking head. And all three, jobbed, all three jobs around, revolved around his family sport. In his country, he became known as the king. He was in charge and he ruled. As a boy, he had played the game and was good at it. But once he became king, he stayed in his big white castle a long, long way away from the game. As captain, he had some success with his country's best. The best were called gamers. As the talking head, his work was not measured as he was just talking about the game and had no direct connection with the action. As the guardian of the game, his job was to produce. He had to produce a way for his country to develop more gamers. Action was required. He needed to know a pathway. The king was paid very, very handsomely in apples, lots and lots of apples. After all, a man must be paid for his time and labor. 
yet his time and labor was a mystery to all. As time went by, the king relinquished his job as captain. Still, as guardian, he had a, ba a band of helpers. Helpers selected hopefuls, and hopefuls were hopeful to become gamers. Unfortunately, many hopefuls became spoiled, and some went from golden to rotten. So old hopefuls were sent home bruised, and new shiny hopefuls were chosen. And thus, the cycle so continued. Absolutely no one from outside the king's inner circle cared about the king's job as a talking head, but everybody cared very, very deeply about his job as guardian. After all, he was the keeper of the people's game. His people wanted to have the best gamers of the game, and there was a deep, deep concern that Hattrick, mistake I know, did not know what he needed to know. Eventually, there was a change. The people were constantly talking about the work of the, their king, and their constant talk morphed into great winds of discontent. One day, while Hattrick sat on his throne, miles and miles away from his helpers and hopefuls, a gust of nasty wind knocked over bushels of apples. Apples fell from high, high in the castle's rafters. Lo and behold, the apples landed on the king's head and knocked him out. But the heartbeat was still discovered. The king would live, and his thinking would never be the same. Thank God. The king traveled to meet with his helpers. His chief helper, named Jose, also lived, lived far, far away in his very own big white castle, away from the helpers and the hopefuls. Once all the helpers had gathered, the king and Jose shared the king's message that came from the hit on his head. The message was found in his birth name. The name had a mistake within. He yelled his last name, mistake I know. In perfect English, it sounded like this, mistake I know. He yelled repeatedly, mistake I know. He was then reminded that all his helpers only spoke Spanish. Jose translated the message. The king realized he should only have one golden job. The job was worthy for a king. He remained in front of the people, and even if the talking head's listeners did not listen to him, he still had the platform to speak. This job made the king feel regal, royal, and respected. He gave up his, his position as guardian, and his helpers were sent home to, de to develop their very own beginning hopefuls. The selected hopefuls then returned to the open fields. The king, with a major blow to his head, had finally come to his senses. He made the playing field level for everybody. The apples sent to help the hopefuls travel near and far were now shared with all. So, with change, there were enough apples for a new plan. No one was given anything. All had to compete for everything. The king eventually realized he had the right position for himself. The king was saved. He still had one golden job. The king remained as the talking head. The king will live happily ever after. Long live the king. Hat trick. Mistake I know. With uh, mistake I know... With Lake Nona, all that money spent on one zip code, we could talk about that. Now, you mentioned, okay, 25 tournaments. Well, they had 25 tournaments all in one place. I mean, we're a huge country. Lake Nona is a long ways away from, say, Seattle, going the other, you know, across the country on a diagonal. But with uh, Jose, um, let me say this about someone who I've met, worked for his company for two years, Alan Schwartz. Um, at one time, he had 55 indoor clubs. He was the chairman of the board of the USTA. And what he tried to do, as far as money is concerned, is when they would you know, bring the board together, he wanted them not to fly first class, not to stay in the most expensive hotels, not to go to the most expensive restaurants, but it all backfired. So I just, again, I really think that the, the money should go to the, go to the people. It's public money. With Jose, and again, people uh, think so highly of him in so many ways, but um, my understanding was he, he wasn't on the court with kids that are under 12. That um, he, Patrick, was in Oyster Bay. You know, he was in New York. And when he was the lead coach, he was in California. I know I had, uh, I can name boom, 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 three juniors that with their mom or dad, or both, they flew out to Palm Desert to work with <coughs> with Jose. Um, and I don't really think that's that's the way that that should be done. 
um, with, you know, wanting to work with the very best players. I mean, I think really the three words that would, uh, help everybody is education, 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 but people get to a certain point. It's like Agassi one time was on TV. I understand that he may be doing some, uh, television work. I think that would be great. I'd love to listen to him talk about tennis. One time he was talking about Roddick and he said, I would die for his serve. I never got any free points. But they asked him about Roddick's forehand. He said, oh, it's too complicated. It takes him too long to get the racket in the pocket. You know, and Roddick, I mean, on the return, he stood further back than Federer. I say this all the time, is that quote the pros. What do the pros say? What does Andy Roddick say about his own game? And, you know, he, he said, well, Roger's an, an artist, a technician. I just hit the crap out of the ball. Well, Roger could stand in really close where he, where he could return. Um, but yeah, so I think that's, that's one of the biggest problems is, um, and I understand with the budget cuts, they may not be flying people in, um, to these, uh, UST camps. So, you know, we had a tribute to Andy Brandy. So and my connection with Andy Brandy, I worked for a company that he and his brother worked for before I started. And through Andy, that's how I got to work with Welby Van Horn. But I can remember being in Boca and, you know, Andy was at, he was a director at Everett's one point, but then he was a UST national coach. And, um, you know, people, people have to be politically correct. You know, these kids come in and it's like, whoa, you know, they're brought in because they're doing really well. I think that, uh, you know, let the, let the private coaches do their work. But there was all sorts of kids that went through that is the writing was on the wall. I mean, if you really knew something about the serve, you knew something about the forehand, the backhand. Um, I like what you said earlier about misrepresentation with, um, uh, you know, I think Greg Patton was a, a guest on our podcast. Great guy. He, he was a, a national coach. He, mm -hmm. he, for the longest time, the college program is overseas. You take the American team, just retired this past year. And, you know, I know so many people will speak so highly of working with, with Greg Pat. Um, and there's all these connections like Brad Stein, kind of like his little brother. Um, you know, he's doing so much so well with Tommy Paul and he has with other players, you know, he worked with Jim Courier. Um, but on one of the Roddick podcasts, you know, they're asking, uh, um, he asked Brad Gilbert a question and Brad goes, you know, the way Brad answered the question, um, it would not apply to little kids. It would not apply to kids that are just starting out. You know, Andy on his own podcast was asked about, um, his grip, I believe it was on the forehand side. He goes, I'm from Nebraska. I don't do grips. Um, you know, I think of Mark Kovacs as somebody like a Nick Saviano. One time was on a, um, a panel at Fair State with Nick Saviano. And, you know, he was with USTA for a long time. And, you know, he goes, well, I coach Michael Chang. I coach Jim Courier. I just, you know, I coach Pete Sapperis because that's who, that's who the top juniors were when he was there. Like Paul Rodert, uh, an academician, Mark Kovacs, you know, he's written several books and like Rotor, he's written many chapters for books, but you know, he can do the same thing. Well, I worked with, you know, um, this player and that player that were with the USTA. So I'm glad you said that misrepresentation, um, with, uh, the USTA. Yeah, I think it's deceiving. It's deceiving the, uh, and you know, the, whether they're flying people in for the little camps, you know, I, have attended those. So I feel like I can speak on it. And, um, I think I've even shared this on this form before a platform before is that <clears throat> I remember when Ashlyn was not really on the radar, but starting to get on the radar and, um, Ashlyn Kruger and she, I went down to, uh, Nona with her, I don't know, 12, 13, I can't remember exactly. And the Richard Ashby and Johnny Parkett's were, Parks, they were the, the lead coaches for the uh, camp with the best, you know, six of the best girls in that, or better girls in that age group in America. And, you know, in my eyes, watching the girls over the first day, to me, there was one, maybe two, Ashlyn being one and maybe a second girl that was a lefty, I can't remember her name, that I thought were on a path that could lead somewhere. And, 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 uh, those, the generic nature 
I, I don't think the coach, I think the coach's hands were tied. They had a, yeah, they had a curriculum they were going to follow that was kind of status quo. And, um, but it was, it was interesting to me because, you know, as one of the letters that we're referencing tonight stated, there is a definite effort made to separate, it seems, players from their coach, from their situation they're in and from their parents in a sense because, uh, um, you know, for me to go down there and, and it was really an investment. And in, in all honesty, it was like uh, using my vacation money to go down there. Uh, airfare was paid. And then for six days, I think it was a $500 stipend given to me from the USGA. Um, and Nick Saviano was there. Um, and he stayed half a day. And he asked me about, he, he knew of Brookhaven. And I, I just remember talking to him on the sidelines. And he said, how, he, he actually looked at me and he said, how come you're here? Um, he said, because uh, I told him, I said, our, our club is half of Lake Nona in terms of the size and 25, six pros and 25, 26 pros. And he, he uh, you know, he had a big part in that USG at one point, but he just kind of shook his head and he said, he's staying half a day and then he's driving back. And um, I just didn't get it. And then I vividly remember sitting in the, the phone call that I've talked about where, you know, you got to evaluate uh, the kid's performance and, and uh, Corey Kruger, the father was on the phone and we were sitting in a room around a round table and, and uh, we basically asked for funding for help because, uh, you know, there's a lot of sacrifice from the parents end already at that point. Certainly I think, uh, you, it's a given that there's going to be a coach or somebody, some group of people behind it that are putting in a lot of selfless time. And, and they said she hadn't done anything. You know, they were looking for people that were 14 that were winning 18, that kind of thing. And, and uh, so, I mean, I think Roddick even refers to it on his podcast. I mean, what is player development? I mean, it, it's like, is it the ability to have talent identification? and see something uh, not as it is now, or but really what it could be, especially given the right circumstances? Or is it, you know, maybe somebody like Higueras taking people that are definitely rounding third base and, and continually, continuing to push them towards home? Um, or is it getting rackets in the hands of a lot of kids and giving them the right pathway from the very beginning so they have a good chance to make their high school team play, play uh, potentially in college. And then who knows beyond that, but everything to me just seems with these letters and going back to that, everything's so vague. I just feel it like I wouldn't even know where to start because like I said, there's just, there's no destination really. That's clearly there. There's no key point that's brought out. There's, um, the, the objective just is, is just not clear to me on what they're what they're really shooting for. With uh, so many things, cherry picking, a lot of players I've worked with, Maria Smith, I remember sending her out to your place. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, she played tennis at Berkeley. She had um, records for uh, how well she did. And, like, she had the world's record for the 100-yard dash for an 8-year-old, something, things like that, several records, year after year based on her you know, her chronological uh, performances. So, you know, Julie Scott, you know, someone told me the other day that she's ranked one in the ITF. Uh, she was 29 and one at Stanford. Uh, one of her teammates, you helped me with Julie Scott big time and Clayton Stanley. Mm -hmm. We're going to have Clayton on. He's going to turn 50 in October. We're going to have him on young guy who uh, really bright guy. He could have gone to Ivy League schools, but he was dead set on going to Texas. And he, I, I want to jump on. I want to jump in on that, but just listen. I promise I won't say a word. But with, uh, so anyway, with um, Clayton said, yeah, if, if she had, he just said it to me one time in conversation. If he, she had started with the serve from the get go, you know, she didn't really give pro tennis that long a run, but um, you know, certainly um, a great tennis player. But she was just a Ferrari, 
And actually her brother, Robbie Scott, might have been one of the best athletes that we ever just had. He came out for a couple of days, but he wanted no part of uh, changing his strokes. He was just, he was just ultra competitive. Uh, I can remember working with Vince Spady and he, with you, and he was a great player before we um, we worked with him. And it was just very briefly, and he won the Orange Bowl. And um, I can remember one day we're running practice and Stan Smith shows up, you know, because at that time he was with the USTA. And um, from the service line back, such great leg, such a great return, forehand, backhand. But I can remember, like you say, when the ball would come right at Spadia, he was going to run around his backhand volley. He's going to jam himself hitting his forehand volley. I have film of him trying to play, you know, conventional approach volleys. Um, but it, was, it wasn't to be, you know, so... Um, but one thing is that we can do, Yvonne, David, we put these letters together and we'll put them on a Facebook page. Perhaps we could even put it on the, on the website, but there's, you know, the letter with, uh, Craig Tiley when he, I didn't write it to the USTA. I just sent it out and then it was put on zoo tennis. It was put out here, there, and over, I guess the term is it went viral. But with that, it was just, uh, those interested in American tennis, I'll just read the first, uh, letter or the first sentence. When I read a, an American magazine, American tennis magazine, that a former student of mine turned down the option to assist the governing body of American tennis with player development, it's time to write a letter. You know, Craig Tyler was really basically trained by an American. And, uh, but, you know, when he was hired in Australia as a South African, you know, I just remember Leighton Hewitt going, why didn't they hire a mate? You know, why didn't they hire a fellow Aussie? Um, Jason Stoltenberg and Paul McNamee, um, John Newcomb. You know, I, I don't know this for a fact, but I think that's why Tyler came up with the John Newcomb medal is that the, the good old boy network was like, why do they, why do they hire a South African? But, you know, Tyler is loved around the world. He's looked upon as being the, uh, very sharp guy. I mean, I mean, you, you know, the guy so well, you spent so many years with him. He's looked upon as being the best tournament director. And I think now he's really a mover and shaker with what's going to happen with pro tennis. I mean, Tennis Australia has had a lot to do with the Labor Cup. But anyway, this letter is, um, was read by a, a number of people. But now that he's a CEO, I just know through a lot of contacts in Australia that um, things that I said that would that he would do is direct, because he was first director of player development, um, easier said than done. Um, you know, like, well, gee, how could you have a unified program? I think it would be much easier in um, in Australia because it's a smaller country than the United States population-wise. Like, say, in Canada, I think around the world, people think the Canadian Federation is doing great, but it's they just have hungry immigrants. There's not really a connection mm -hmm. with, um, you know, so you got Dennis and Bianca and Felix, and before that, it was. Uh, Brownish. Brownish, the big serve, um, Elosh. But it says, well, the Federation must be doing it. So I think the Federation, uh, they do jump up and, and take credit uh, of all this money spent. And, you know, we were we were doing better in player development before 87. But mm -hmm. then what happened in 89 when the Berlin Wall came down, tennis exploded in Eastern Europe. Um, but going on with just more history of this is that uh, from Australia with Tylee, Craig Morris comes into the picture. And Craig Morris, Javier, Javier Palenque, he had a chance to meet with the USTA. And um, he met with uh, the former CEO, wasn't there very long. And with, uh, again, that number 800,000, I understand that Martin Blackman, 800,000, I don't know if that's true, but his public domain. And, you know, Martin Blackman, classy guy, uh, eloquent speaker. He was uh, Patrick McEnroe's roommate at Stanford. And I think that's a political move that he wasn't going to come in and say, you know, whoever follows him, you know, you have your predecessor and your successor. So if Martin Blackman didn't come in and go, well, this is the new program. This is what we're doing. He came in and said, oh, I'm going to build upon what Patrick did. And... um if it is political, hey, for, for, for eight hundred thousand dollars, I'd tell people you never <laughs> used to yell at me. <laughs> with, uh, I mean, but with Craig Morris, he's actually in charge because they put community tennis and um, 
player development uh, together. And I understand that. I mean, I don't hear that. I don't hear it anyway, that USTAU, uh, maybe that's a lot, you know, live and well, uh, I was invited by Scott Schultz up to Lake Nona and I'm a ball hopper guy and he's a briefcase guy. Great guy. Paul, excuse me, um, Scott Schultz, um, asked, well, we're thinking about putting a committee together. You know, perhaps, you know, we could consider you to be on the committee. You could consider being on the committee. And, and, uh, at that time it was, uh, the Vic brain library. I said, this is one thing that UCA should do. Why don't you buy the Vic brain library? And, but, you know, he, I was told by Andy Andrews when I had a chance to meet with him, the incoming president who had to step down, he said that Scott wasn't high enough on the ladder. So you, you really have to be, you know, on the board. I mean, like, I, I think the old Peter Burwash thing where it's an upside down triangle, you know, let the people be at the bottom, you know, you know, that's where the, that's where the, the importance is or that, that foundation is not going to stay up. But I think it's really top. Mm -hmm. I think it's always been really top heavy. Like a, a Kirk Camperman, um, nine hundred thousand dollars for years, and it's like wow, this is so much money. Um, with um, mm. Ray Benton, here's another eight hundred thousand. With this was in the New York Times, and you know he's a highly educated guy. You know he's at the. Uh, he wasn't always there. He was an agent. You know, he was connected way back with Donald Dell and you know, mm -hmm. Don, Donald Dell. Actually, his um, daughter sent me a text. She's bringing her kids back up here. Christina Dell. So Donna, Donald Dell, what a brilliant guy. He was a great player, great basketball player, tennis player. He um, plays Davis Cup. He's a captain of Davis Cup back when Hopman was, you know, just dominating. I think it was in 68, the Americans. They beat the uh, beat the Australians, but he he could be at a tournament where, you know, perhaps he uh, was um, in part ownership with the tournament. He was directing the tournament. He was the agent of the two players who were in the finals, and he's in the booth doing the TV. You know, we all have to thank Donald Dell. Donald Dell is the reason Vic Braden got on TV, the, the P PBS, mm -hmm. uh, because Donald Dell was mentored by Jack Kramer. Vic Braden was mentored by Jack Kramer. And where, where would we be if, if, if Vic didn't get on TV back in the 70s? Um, so it's, it's, it's amazing so much history. But with Greg Morris, um, you know, so he did come in with, uh, like, they're doing so great in Australia. Boy, I mean, I think that's where we all get so confused with the, uh, the success of the, the majors. It's like tennis has four Super Bowls. And, yeah, the Australian Open, it's fantastic. Same thing in Australia. And Javier Palenque, I mean, I mean, he's done his research with with what goes on with uh, Tennis Australia, and then to pick on Tennis Australia, just the uh, it's amazing the federations that you know how's Rick, how Rick Braden used to say, uh, "I got to save up to be weighed." You used to go to a grocery store and you could put a penny in, you could walk into a grocery store and you could weigh yourself, and that was the line. I got to I got to save up, I got to save up to be weighed. <laughs> With um, one thing I have down here is uh, um, a Ty Tucker idea. The um, let me share that with you guys. Mm -hmm. Ty Tucker, coach at Ohio State, um, with what he told me. You know, this is his idea, but I I should have called him up and said, "Tell him, tell me again what what should be done." But basically, it's a program. You know, you get to give, give to get. So you take college tennis players. You don't have to work it all out. Is it for freshmen only? Is it for graduates only? But no, say, that, you know, someone who um, is in, they're, they're ranked top 10 in singles and doubles. There's just criteria. What, you know, I don't know exactly what his criteria was, but that they're selected. And then, you know, the USTA can say, well, if you're going to do this, you want to turn pro after two years, fine. But you have to continue your education. Like the ATP has it available where if someone wants to, uh, I was talking to Arvind, Arvind Don, um, Ram Ramanathan, someone who went to the US Open a couple of times with him, with Arvind, at playing pro tennis and got his degree, his college degree. 
uh, Raven Klassen was playing with a Swedish guy who's got, who got his masters and it was all paid for by the ATP. If so, uh, there's some really good things. There's like the UCA, a lot of good people. There's a lot of, a lot of uh, good solid programs like that. So say for example, hypothetically that the USTA, all this money, they fund players for two years. So then they have to be trained. They're going to be trained as a teacher, trained as a coach. That's where they give back. And it's not all, everything's not going to happen in one zip code. So say, for example, they play two years, and this is more criteria, that they get to be 300 in the world. You know, maybe it's 350. WTA, ATP. We sponsored you for two years, funded you, kept your education going, not only educated you as far as um, college degrees and such, but we educated you to have a profession in tennis. Um, not that that's one who necessarily wanted to want to do that, but you know, you give two years and then you have to teach for two years and then they could be even funded as an apprentice. So they could pick someone like yourself because you've had results because you've developed so many players. So then this could all be funded with, you just think about all the funny money. Um, you know, let's say Yvonne, you and I were just were sitting at a table and we go, oh, there's millions of dollars here. How much do you want? Uh, I'll take a million. So, you know, the people that are making the decision on where the money goes, it's like crazy. So then say for another two years, you play, and then you crack, after four years of support, you crack 150. Um, but then say if you don't, then you have to, you know, maybe it's just a third year. But it's just a great idea. And it could be funded. It could all be put in place. It could all be put in place. There'd have to be the education for the pro. And I think that's where that would go in circles. Like, well, but can we at least teach them tennis math? Can they, do they at least have to learn the dimensions of the court? Do they have to learn the grips? And then it's the base. It's the, it's the base. You know, Richard Hernandez, tennis, uh, the tennis world needs a great base initiative. That's where we're going to lose kids because if, if someone, you know, they can't hit a forehand or they can't hit a backhand, um, I would Braden used to say about the reading groups, you got the Blue Jays, you got the Sparrows, and you got the Robins. And the Robins are the slow readers. The Robins know they're the slow readers. If you, if you can't hit it, you can't hit it. Um, what do you think of that idea? Well, I think it's, I mean, we, like I said earlier, we have to draw a lot of fresh blood into the, the career. Uh, of tennis teaching, tennis coaching. I think it's, it's a solid concept. Um, how and how it, how it could be implemented, I, I don't know. It, it, it would have to take somebody with a lot of vision, somebody with a lot of um, genuine care for the game to be able to, to put that all together. Because um, that typical person now, even if we – I saw, I, I can't remember what I was reading recently, but it showed the stats on, you know, 20 years ago when they were interviewing college, sophomore, junior, seniors, and, you know, do you have an interest in getting into tennis as a career path? And, and the percentage was pretty high. And I know they did it recently again, and, and it was extremely low, about a third of what it was back then. So we got to draw people in somehow. Um, those kind of people that I think we're talking about, um, typically, are, if they do fall into the profession, they are people who are um, a, a different level third base coach than, say, we were talking about Higueras with Chang and and Courier. They're they're a junior tennis third base coach. Um, you know, they're a third base coach on a smaller baseball field, and. Um, you know, they, and, and I, you know, I, I feel for him because, you know, it's exciting for me to watch some of the coaches that have been here for a long time, like coach Andreas, um, to see his simulation now for, I mean, just, just like you've said your whole life, you know, you're a low performance coach. I mean, in a joking manner, but he, he, he delights now in just taking people and just, um, grinding them through basic things and because he's gotten really good at it he, he's really developed a high level of competency or to watch Mary Poe um, just through 
the way she communicates with young kids and word picture method and and you know she's put her own style into everything and um, to watch her mold four five six year olds to get them get them swinging in a circle and, and getting them to get the racket on the on the on the volley in the right manner and um, I, I I think that those people would have a better chance to stay in the tennis teaching career. Uh, if they if they were educated in a proper manner on how to get into the career, I just I, I think we owe it to this generation coming through as tennis teachers to give them the best chance so that you know at 35 they're not either and nothing against these professions, but tennis players are either selling insurance, financial planning, or real estate. That's their next step, and uh, it doesn't have to be that way. They can they can do it till the day they die and. It, but if you just go into it, kind of remembering how you were trained in college, cross courts, down the lines, high lows, play some points. Well, you're limiting yourself to what kind of career you can have. With, yeah, I think tennis teaching, people should pride themselves on being a tennis teacher. We teach everyone to teach. Even if you're just going to be a hobby coach, it's going to come back to help you out. I mean, what a great conversation piece if someone can actually teach tennis and they actually acquire tennis knowledge. Certainly people could work as, as you know, a part-time supplemental income or people could do it full-time. You know, one thing in my spoof that, uh, under that Yvonne read with, uh, Patrick McEnroe, here's a lesson for all this is that Harry Hopman comes, he has a falling out with Australia and he comes to the United States and he's in Port Washington. Before he went to Florida, he was on Long Island and the McEnroe family, they were introduced to Mr. Hopman. You know, they work on overheads for three hours or work on this stroke for three hours. And, you know, he had to dismiss John, but there was from, from practice occasionally or just one time. And that was enough to turn it around. And, um, but you know, you, you read about the McEnroe's as they really respected Davis cup to the point where Patrick, they didn't know if he was going to be good enough to play for the United States. So because of his Irish heritage, and I remember telling Paul Rohr, hey, I'm not going to be at that meeting with Patrick McEnroe, but, uh, you know, my son is in Ireland. You know, he's doing what Patrick did. You know, I had my son, he went to Ireland, he got to the finals, and he lost. Patrick, he won the Irish Junior Nationals on grass with the Fitzwilliams. You know, Connor was in the finals, and, he, you know, he went a little further with his career than the person he lost to, but it starts to rain. They're playing artificial grass. He grabs his shoulder bag. He starts running off the court. And the umpire says, Mr. Smith, where are you going? You know, they play actually in the rain. But anyway, that's that that was, you know, that's one thing with the McEnroe's, the passion, I think the history that, well, our kid, we don't know if he's going to be good enough. And he did uh, play some for the uh, U.S. Davis Cup team. And then he was the captain. So what history, but it, at one time it was so important for them to have their kid play Davis cup. It's like, well, we'll go to Ireland and he could play on the team there. You know, my son Connor, he had the choice. Um, you know, he could have played for Ireland, but, and when he was 200 in the world, you know, he would have been in the lineup. And I said, your choice, my vote would be you go do it, you know, with, um, but yeah, you hang in there. You look at like an Austin Krychek, he. You know, now he's playing Davis Cup. He's going to go to, the, go to the Olympics. The Bryan brothers, for the longest time, they didn't get a shot to play. They, they should have been asked much sooner than they were. But they just, you know, you got to have that stick to Um, This has to be asked in a setting like this. With the USTA, should the USTA, PT, the PTR and the USPTA, should they, should they have embraced pickleball? Or should they have remained tennis? I, I, to me, <laughs> I have pretty strong opinion about it, but, uh, I, I get why they're doing it, but I think that's a totally separate entity in my opinion. Um, I think that it's undeniable that pickleball and, and really in many places in the U S right now, Padel is making a extremely strong push, especially out on the, you know, the West Coast, I know that Ryan Redondo, who was a former great, you know, junior player and collegiate player and played a bit on the tour. I think he's building hundreds of Padel facilities or courts out there. 
Yeah, um, Barnes Tennis Center. Um, yeah, they had, I don't know, 16, 19 new courts, pickleball courts. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and he's so loves pedal. I, I think it's yeah. I think it to me it should have it should have been a separate organization. Um they have the PPA. They have uh um organizations that can manage that, that part of the sport. I I think they're doing it because it's it's pretty much become mainstream at any tennis club and you know the day the day will come in probably in our lifetime maybe not i don't know how many years we all have left but um that you know it's you won't be a director of tennis at a at a, at a tennis club I, I the majority of the clubs i would admit, estimate you won't be a director of tennis at them unless you have equal amount of background with padel pickle and tennis um, sure seems like it's headed that way. I did, um, I did some work we, for Tennis Corporation of America and they had squash courts. And I remember telling uh, Doug Cash and whoever, um, I can spell it, but I can't cook it. But what I did was, uh, it was in Rochester, New York. I just called Cornell and we said, okay, we have to hire the Cornell squash coach to come and train some people. I wasn't going to pretend that I was going to be an overnight squash coach. You know, I know absolutely yeah. nothing, nothing about it, but the one thing about squash, I mean, it, it had its own problems with growth. It, they, there was a uh, international squash and American squash. It was two different court dimensions. It was two different balls. You know, now they do have one uniform ball, one uniform court surface. Um, but I think the difference between squash and badminton is they haven't invaded tennis i've said it over and over again well where we are right now is that we've got to can't beat them we got to join them but i just think that we did sell out too quickly that you know and so many people are overnight pickleball experts um with um i have to get this in when we're talking about the usta uh, i have so many things sent to me and i was you know sometimes been sent things that don't don't ever share this so i was okay i mean that means don't uh forward it don't email it anybody else but it was uh, John Mackin was speaking to the national coaches and you know he basically said I can handle the Canadians being better than us in hockey but I cannot handle the Canadians being better or in tennis um, and then, you know some of the you know some of the people in the room or a majority of the people in the room were insulted where I do think that just too much of that takes place in tennis is that you know, I told an academic dean when I was in Tyler, Texas, and I'm dealing with job placement and whatever, and he said, well, he goes, I think you're rocking the boat. And I said to him, I can't rock the boat. The boat's underwater. And he looked at me and he said, you should be a Baptist minister. And with uh, the boat, the boat was underwater. Um, I think with player development, I think tennis teaching, you know, it's, we have, uh, you know, they're just playing the trumpets, like we're doing so great in American tennis. Um, you know, that's where Javier Palenque, you know, he's talking about how many people are playing. Is that really true that we have 24 million people playing? Um, with, I don't think you can gauge tennis by how many tennis balls are sold. You know, and then how, how, how connected are people with tennis? Um, but I do think that, you know, you inherit problems. You know, so, um, Certainly, you've been in Brookhaven 30 years, but when you started, you inherited problems. It wasn't wasn't the program it is now, but you did have GPS because you, it's kind of like when I, the same academic dean told me, um, you've got the ball, the football mentality of Texas, you got the ball, run with it. In other words, this is what needs to be done. And yeah, I think that there's probably uh, a lot of second guessing, you know, you, someone to be on the inside and can you really uh, have autonomy and okay, I want to do this and, and this is how it's going to be done. And, um, or is, you know, you know, a chain of command going to question, you know, well, we want to, uh, have, you know, kids learn the Welby Van Horn balance method. Oh, well, it's awful slow. It's old school. It's like, no, they have to learn how to be on balance period. And I think you have to have somebody with that type of leadership, leadership and management are two different things. Whoever, you know, right now, one of the things is that they have that 100 court facility. And you know, I, I would have said, no, that's, you know, how, how that, how's that going to help some kid? Andy Roddick and the family, they're from Nebraska. 
how's that facility going to help somebody from Nebraska? So I guess one final question, Yvonne, yep. what you can throw your two cents in as we wind down here is that we'll, we'll get all these letters put on, you know, organized so people can read them with, um, but the program, um, Jose Garris thinks the program doesn't need to have budget cuts. They need to maintain, they need to stay with the budget, stay with the program financially. Wayne Bryan, his letter says it should be dropped. What do you think? Well, I, I, I lean a little bit more towards Wayne Bryan's concept of what the player development is and what people think it is. And I, I think it, eliminating it. I mean, when he, he uses the word, it emasculates people in the, in, in, that are developing tennis players outside of their castle. And, and it's very true. And, and unfortunately, this is the first go around for many of these junior players and their families. And how are you not going to be seduced by the wild cards? And you, you, you come here, we'll do this. And I think Wayne, you know, I, I have had the opportunity to watch him work on court, the court right on the court that I'm going to be on tomorrow morning. And, and uh, you know, he is, he's very, very blunt guy behind the scenes when he's not doing his Pied Piper role. I, I really like him. I, I like what he said about it. Truthfully, I I think there's better places to shoot the arrows. I think there's better there's better game to hunt than than what they're trying to hunt through that particular vehicle with the USPA. It doesn't mean that it has to be completely um, eliminated in the in 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 the funding. The funding just needs to be allocated differently. Um, I've always believed that there could be pockets set up in hotbeds throughout. And I know they have regional training centers and that, which we were approached to be many, many years ago. And, you know, I remember talking to Billy Freer and saying, I'd really prefer not to be, even though it was, you know, it would have been a big feather in the hat for Brookhaven and this and that. But I said, I, I don't want to be mandated by what we're doing and uh, how we're doing it and how it has to be in compliance with what they want. And um, so I, I, if I lean one direction, yeah, I'd lean towards Wayne Bryan's comment. I think going back to Julie Scott, mother Gail is that, uh, you know, she started doing really well and, and Gail just said, no, we're fine. Cause it was, it was a matter of the kids from Tyler, Texas, 90 miles away to go to Dallas when I first got to Tyler, Texas, people said, oh, kids in Tyler can't compete with kids from Dallas. And I said, what's a year different? I said, are you kidding me? No, but it was the second five years. In the first five years, that wasn't the case. But the second five years that I spearheaded that program, we were doing A-OK with the kids from Dallas and Houston. Mm -hmm. and yeah, the, the term intoxicate, I heard Dave Secker say that, coach at NC State. Um, and we had a, a dad in here last week or yeah, the time goes by so fast. It was more like two weeks ago. His daughter spent six weeks with us or six months with us, um, had injuries. Miran man just said, you know, Hey, go down to this place. And, and they did it. And then they came another six months and she's good enough where she's traveling around the world and playing for Canada. And, um, but that's where start the course, stay the course and the common denominators. Um, you know, I think that's where it is tough to say, well, this is free and we have wild cards and we're going to take you here. We're going to take you there. But it's just like when kids are re recruited, you know, I, you know I've, I know you've had this happen many times is I, I've become the best friend of some college coaches during the recruiting process. But then after they go to school, I never hear from them. Um, has that been the same for you? Yeah, I think it's pretty common. Um, right inside of the city even or, uh, a young man playing at SMU who uh, is not playing. He should have been playing if he would have, I think, stayed the course. Uh, he was number three in SoCal. His dad used to live with me back in East Texas back when we had the tennis connection. His <laughs> dad played one at A&M. Um, but, you know, he had every intent, intention of it, it seemed. He was here in the summer prior and working on his skills and the first year, you know, it was every week coming up 
just continuing to grow his game and and now it's going into senior year and it, it's been a ghost um so i think it you know part of it might be the program but i think the kid i think that you know i always go back to character i mean i, I heard you say it decades and decades and decades ago and you know that you know, the character if you can't if you can't teach it and it's going to be hard to get somebody down the road and i think that as kids get into, if they, if they don't fall into the right tennis culture, and there's a lot of great, you know, levels of play type programs out there, but there's, there's not a lot of guys like Saban that are, that really have the best interest of the player um, that are teaching them to, to be better at their tennis game and better at their, their life and pushing it that direction. Um, And then mistakes start to happen. And, you know, before you know it, you've missed your turn and it's too far back to, to backtrack. So uh, I think that's what happens most of the time, in my opinion. Um, let me say this about uh, the USTA. First of all, it's I think it's the times are tough for everybody to develop players. I mean, uh, Vic Braden told me that Wayne Bryan was a really good football player. I'm just going to guess that he was a really good baseball player, uh, probably good basketball as well. That was just back the way it was in those days, you could play all three of those major sports. Now there's a story about, uh, you know, Wayne is a young kid in high school. He, he puts a call into Vic Braden and, you know, Vic Braden uh, free of charge goes and does some free service for his high school. Um, you know, the, their mother, uh, Kathy Blake was a really great player, but um, anyway, with like a, you know, I think of Wayne, Wayne Bryan. I'm old enough where one one thing reminds me of another. I when I was 20 years old, I was hanging out with Wayne Saban. <laughs> you know, I was became the perennial tennis player at Boca Raton. And Wayne Saban was top 10 in the world, and it is all about character. With uh, yeah, we, we know we we do turn to the football coaches. Like we started off talking about the the bas- the basketball coaches at South Carolina. But I, mm-hmm. I, do, I, do, I don't think it's a matter of just pointing fingers, but, uh, you know, I think a lot of money is, is spent. I think Roddick's question is how much money is spent on executives, how much money is spent on players. Uh, something else in this podcast is what, what do we do as individuals? Um, don't throw stones, live in a glass house. With, um, But no, I think, like, say, for example, your manual, the coaches that are listening to this podcast, and I mean, there's so many podcasts. I mean, we're just a drop in the ocean. But a lot of blood, sweat, and tears went into the manual. Um, I can just look at it and, you know, just it's connected to, you know, education is just about sharing. You know, just like, say, the McEnroe's were connected to Harry Hotman. And your your thought about go back to the future. Um, but, no, thanks for that, the free content. I mean, that's what we're trying to do. Um, but I really think that... Um, you know, I would, I would, uh, go with, um, Wayne, Wayne Bryan is that, you know, too much money is being spent. They got to regroup. You know, I think the Mitchell, Mitchell Kruger asking about tournament play. Um, but, uh, Yvonne, why don't you wrap it up and we'll sign us off here. Yeah. I was listening to you guys and I wrote just a few, few thing, few things down that I enjoyed, um, to keep for, you know, my tennis treasure chest. Um, yeah, I'd like to share them. They're from just random points in the podcast. Um, if the players don't respect their parents, we have no chance. Countries with the least amount of money have the best players. Dave, you said nuking forehands. I enjoyed that. Nu- nuking forehands. If you don't know strokes, you don't know strategy. I'm from Nebraska. I don't do grips. <laughs> Um, you can't rock the boat. Um, the boat's underwater. So just a couple of things I wrote down that, you know, I, I enjoyed listening to you guys. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. It's always fun to do this. Yeah. I um, could talk, talk for hours on it. With, uh, I do think in tennis, um, Teddy Roosevelt, I'm not giving you, I'm just telling you the truth. It sounds like hell is, too much edifying of one another. Hey, we're all doing great jobs. And I think that um, um, it's like 
I, I would like to say this. I'm, I'm the biggest critic of, of the Great Base. You know, he, he, I mean, I can tell you that, okay. But there's people who criticize it that um, I was told this by um, a, a woman who's my age who just totally loves tennis from Montreal. She said, you can't criticize it if you haven't studied it. You know, I mean, how, how can you have an opinion if you haven't, you know, um, you know, just looked at the content, but it's not, it's not simple. You can't, you know, just glance over it. There's a, uh, I mean, just that one course, uh, 25 hours, tennis intelligence applied. You know, that's just really a good start. I know you used to say that, uh, cause you ended up helping, you were a student first, but then help, helping the other students is that, you know, two years wasn't really enough. No, it was, it was, a it was, it should have been a four year program for sure. And, uh, I think that, you know, I, I, I always wonder what the, you know, I think when, when I was in the program, when Tylee and I and Dion and other people, when we were in it, I think there were in excess of a hundred students, right? 110, 100 and some students from yeah. various countries and states. And, you know, you wonder over the years, how many of those people, um, stayed with tennis coaching and I know you keep in touch with a lot. I occasionally bump into them and be interesting to, to figure out. And, and you weren't getting uh, necessarily pure tennis people walking through your door down there. Um, you were, you were, you know, developing tennis teachers out of, people who really didn't have a, a great tennis background in many cases, and they became really, really good tennis coaches. Um, yeah. I get tired of the word pedigree, you know, just because someone, yeah. it is a bonus. I mean, Welby Van Horn, probably the best, best combination of player and teacher. And, you know, the word teacher, I mean, how, but how many people in tennis, you know, yeah, I've taken a beginner from this level to this level that, 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 that has to be respected. That's one thing that's very clear and, and, Wayne Bryan's letter. I mean, have you developed mm -hmm. a player? You know, have you taken a kid from point A to point B? And I'm with him is that most people in decision-making positions, powerful positions have not done that. And there's a disconnect between the, the you know, the trench work, the trench work. But uh, yeah, ho hopefully, sure. hopefully we shared some thoughts. I want to say this. Um, uh, if you will sign off, Thank you, thank you, thank you for this, that, and the other, th other thing. But I'll call you back as soon as we sign off because there's a young girl here that um, I started off, and you've been, she's been to your place, and she's here, and she's still very young. But it's six years later, and we're still talking to her about the grips. And you mm. know, going into the four teens, with her birthday, she already is international four teens, but. Um, yeah, I just think that, uh, we'll sign off. And then I say that because it reminds me of, uh, the word characters come up so many times, but Chad Berryhill, who, I mean, it's not very easy to win national anything. He's won a couple of national titles. So he's standing right next to me and I reprimand a daughter and a father, you know, and I, I, I get to the point where I talk to the parents, just like I talk to the juniors, I think with, 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 um, How's it go with case study with eight years in the game? So anyway, after I reprimand the daughter and the father, Burial says to me, that's what needs to be on the course. <laughs> so yeah, we'll sign off for our listeners. Uh, the uh, probably better. We just had a podcast talking to this, this young kid is that um, you have to get to the point where, okay, you know, you're not going to have this option on the return to serve. Uh, you're not going to have this option on a clean approach volley. Uh, you could do it now and really pay your dues and just tackle this thing, just own it. Um, you know, that being said, and I look forward to the University of Virginia. I'm sure they're both men and women. They're going to host here and it's 45 minutes away and go in and watch. And but the, the doubles that they're playing, I mean, you got Collins who went to school there and Navarro went to school there. But, I mean, come on, just hit a serve and go to the net. I remember uh, the late Dave Schneider uh, 
um, married Carmen Clark, fast guy, great guy, Stuart. Yeah, Scott Stewart. Scott yeah. Stewart. So this guy was such a character, but he wasn't really well taught to hit a tennis ball. His father was a cross country coach. We've talked about how he would run a mile every day, even at 140 degree temperature. But I remember Dave Schneider saying to me, can't he just go to the net and poke one volley? But back then it was just, you've got to go to the net, you know, and that'd be like uh, a football player not drum, not jumping on a fumble or a hockey player not going to the corner. But, you know, just go, oh, you're there, going to be there for four years. I mean, I'd rather lose the right way than win the wrong way because there's no future in winning the wrong way. But, uh, yeah, we'll sign off. Yvonne, he's the man behind the scenes. He makes all this go. I mean, the podcast is not simple to get done. Thank you, Yvonne. Thank you, yeah, David. Thanks, thanks a lot, Yvonne. Yeah, of course. You bet. Thank you, guys. But good night. And we'll, I will tell you what, the, the nightcap, we'll call you back for just another five minutes. All right, sign it off. Okay. Wave you by the camera. Audience. Take, thanks, David. Take care. Bye-bye. All right. Podcast 192 in the books. <laughs>